All right, and we're live. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the NASCAR Weekly Podcast. we got a big show up today. Um, if you haven't already this week, check out my new Devil's Advocate and Missing Rings coming soon. I'll pass it to Eric now. Hey, guys. Eric Estep here. Uh, if you were there a couple of hours ago, I tried out the new YouTube Premiere feature, which allows you to kind of like live stream a pre-recorded video. So I did that for Out of the Groove today, and I thought it was a huge success. There was 400 people watching, leaving hilarious comments on the side. I thought that was great. So that's something I'm going to try to do at least from time to time on when new episodes come out. So, But if you missed it, the episode is up now, and you can still go check it out. I gave you all my final four, my round of eight predictions there. So if you're interested in seeing that, we'll definitely hit on a little bit of that probably tonight. Uh, but if you want to hear just my opinion, if you don't care about any of these other people, you can find it right over there for, for free. No, but <laughs> anyway, yeah, excited to be here. I'll throw it over to Darian. What's going on, guys? It's your boy, Darian Gilliam, a.k.a. Black Flags Matter. Uh, new upload yesterday, and yes, I did try out that premiere thing yesterday. Uh, I did a championship seasons video on Bobby Labonte's 2001, which is one that is kind of forgotten about. It's not really talked about enough. I mean, he was so dominant, leading 31 I mean, or uh, I said that wrong. He had the points lead for 31 of the 34 races that year and clinched it and, and uh, ended up winning it a, uh, a race early. So uh, make sure to go tune into that. And I don't know. I'm also I'm thinking about maybe doing a NASCAR bus for my next video. Um, so you guys just leave suggestions in the, in the chat and uh, I'll take it into consideration. All right. And we pass to our guests. Uh, we'll start with 10 to go. Yo guys, what's up? This is 10 to go. Um, I'm just uh, happy to be here on the show. Look forward to a good one. And um, I do have been doing countdown videos for a couple of years, kind of dipped out of it for a while, but I'm back now. Um, 10 to go NASCAR and I'll pass this back to you. And I will then pass it over to Evan. Yeah, I don't really have a, an intro thing, but uh, thanks for having me on the podcast, guys. Uh, if you guys watch any of the iRacing stuff, uh, NASCAR Pekana Freeze, all that. I do the commentary stuff, so it's tons of fun. And, uh, of course, watch the race stuff on the weekend. So uh, thanks for the invite. No problem. Uh, and I think first off, we'll probably just jump into the race we had this past weekend at Kansas. So uh, I don't know who wants to go first with this. What are your guys' thoughts on what we saw this past weekend? Well, we pretty much know who our, our main people are now uh, when it comes to just – delivering results and stuff because i mean you saw the consistency from kyle bush this weekend from uh the other uh, the other drivers that are up there at the top and the ones that are consistently um fast and delivering results at the end i think the mile and a half is always are good at that they're kind of not the great equalizer that's talladega or daytona but they are kind of the standard if you run well at the mile and a half you're probably going to run well in the playoffs and you're probably going to make it to homestead and possibly have a shot at the championship so yeah you're right we saw a lot of your our usual players up at the front. Kevin Harvick was great early, like he was here in the spring. Uh, probably had the race one till he, uh, his, he he messed up. That allowed Chase Elliott, who's been the second best driver probably on a consistent basis the last few weeks, to, to step step in there. You mentioned Kyle Busch; he was consistent again, still a top three guy. Uh, you know, I think it was interesting though. You know, I, we had a few big names, guys like Truex. I feel like lagged a little further behind than we would expect. It. Clint Boyer; these are names I think a lot of people expect. You know. They obviously have already made it deep in these playoffs, but these are guys that, you know, are looking to make that jump into the final four. And that's something that, you know, when you look at this weekend in Kansas, you know, maybe a reason to hesitate on them a little bit. Uh, but I, you know, as far as the race goes itself, it was a fun race, decent race. Not a lot happened. I think we only had one yellow that wasn't a stage break. I think it was when Byron blew an engine, I'm pretty sure. That being mm -hmm. said, I still felt like there was a pretty good amount of jostling for position. Kansas is one of the few mile and a half tracks on the circuit with more than one one lane. And that's, I think, what makes it fun to watch typically. You got comers and goers in a run. Uh, so, you know, it was, it was all right. In a nutshell, it was an okay race. thought it was fun. Man, let me just say this, man. Bubba, I don't know. I can't defend him no more. I just can't. I stopped after the Roval. He's pitting, and he's like too close to where the um, the pit crew can change the, the, the left side tires. When I saw that, I was like, man, you know what? Hell no. I'm not about to do this. I'm not doing this no more, man. Come on. Come on. Bubba. My gosh. Wow. Well, I mean, you can go back to other rookies that have made worse mistakes back in the day. Like, I'm sure you can pull like 10 or 12. I just, just. Yeah, but, but he's done these. Oh, he's messed up so it's many better times. Better than speeding on pit road and throwing away the race. Yeah, yeah. I guess. Something. <laughs> I guess. Like, um, so, like, like, um, my, my mom had just gotten home and she texted me. She's like, Bubba's in second. I'm like, yeah, he's green flag pit stops. Of course he's in second. <laughs> <laughs> of course he's in second. 
<laughs> I was like, so, I mean, it's not really a big deal. But anyways, you know, uh, the race as a whole, though, um, I kind of agree with Eric. Um, nothing really happened in terms of cautions. Uh, William Byron blew an engine early, and then you had the other two stage yellows. And nothing was really going on until that final pit stop. Kevin Harvick uh, speeds, and he pretty much throws away the race because I think that's I think he was leading at the time, and I think if he doesn't pit, I mean, if he doesn't mess up, that's his race. Um, and then some of the cars coming up, um, like Kyle Larson, who unfortunately is not winning a title, so now I look like a fool. Oh, yeah, but hold up. But, uh, but uh, Jarrett also predicted, uh, predicted that too, so he looks like a fool with me which is fitting, but yeah, oh, like Larson. I asked about it though. I'm, I'm surrounded by idiots. <laughs> <laughs> You're in the idiocracy. <laughs> no, but Larson, he was coming there towards the end. They really adjusted on that thing, which is really surprising. Cause I was like, dude, they're going to be lucky to even have a top 10 this weekend. But you know, they rallied around him and ended up finishing um, third. I, yeah. Uh, yeah. They ended up finishing third there. And you know, once Harvick made that mistake, Chase Elliott, I mean, that was his race to lose. But this was a perfect scenario, though. Kyle Busch was chasing him, was catching him there. He was running second. And I was tweeting out, I was tweeting out, you know, oh, here we go. This is the hero versus the villain. Like, this is perfect. Like, a perfect scenario would have been another Chicagoland finish with the, um, uh, between those two. That would have been perfect yeah, in, in my view. But, you know, once, um, once Kyle Busch got to about – he got to about – I, I want to say um, four or five tenths back, like um, behind him, he really couldn't do anything else. And uh, it was Chase Elliott's race. And uh, now it's starting to begin the whole narrative that Chase Elliott's, uh, oh, he's definitely a title contender there. Yeah, he's a title contender, but like I, I could see him making the final four, but honestly, I don't see him winning the title. So we got to pump the brakes on those a little bit. I mean, you still got to go against Harvick and Bush. And maybe Truex or someone else. Like, I, I don't know if Truex is going to make the final four. I don't know. You guys uh, take your pick on that one. But, uh, yeah, he still has a lot of guys to go against. But I don't see him, um, like, winning the title yet. Yet, though. He'll get a title eventually. But overall, I'd give this race, um, I'd say, a five and a half. You know, I think that's fair. Yeah, probably fair. Yeah, I'm around there. Because, um, I, again, I, the start of it, I was sort of back and forth, you know, Flip to the Vikings game, then flip to the Bears game, then flip to the the race. Um, it wasn't too, you know special by any means, but again, it's a it's a race at Kansas. It's not going to be awful for the most part, but it's not going to be at the same time great. Um, I think it got better as it went, though. I, I will say it was funny as you're talking about. Uh, oh, I was in second. Yeah, I turned it on like after a long period of time and not watching it uh, after the start to find Bubba in the lead. I'm like. Okay, this has to be green flag pit stops. This can't be. This can't be just pure performance. And sure enough, it was. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's another another race where it got better as it went. For the most part, I, I'd say it's a, another race where the finish sort of dictated more what people thought of the overall race than it probably should have. So I, I'd give it a six out of ten. I think it's above average. I don't think it's anything special though. And it's, but I think that. People who say the race was horrible, I think it's because you look at the racing we've had the last few months, you know, comparatively, it's been much better. Um, but it, it wasn't bad. And I think going into Martinsville, it's fine. So. Yeah, that's a good, um, yeah, Martinsville um, this week as well, too. I, I guess it's a, I guess it's kind of perfectly aligns with, um, with Kansas, I guess, you know, going from, uh, from a, a mile and a half to a short track there. Which, by the way, if you ha if you haven't seen uh, Jarrett's uh, Devil's Advocate video, go watch it after the podcast. It's really good. Yeah. On Martinson, it's going up. I'd say, yeah, you you have a good point there, and we're going from an extremely aero dependent track to one that's not so aero dependent. You're going maybe 110, 115 miles an hour on Martinsville. So I mean, you beat and bang a little bit, and you can still win the race. I mean, was it? We saw somebody with, I forgot who it was. Um, I think it may have been Harvick or someone a few years ago. Like their car was, there wasn't a corner on the car that wasn't in an accident, but that car ended up still winning uh, or at least getting second or third. And um, now this, this track's d definitely different from Kansas where you're going to have more side by side. It'll definitely be fun to watch. Whereas Kansas is one of those races that really only somebody who actually is a racing fan can truly, truly appreciate. Evan, what do you think? I, I agree with that point completely. I missed the start of the race because I was watching the uh, the race in Austin, the F1 race. 
Um, and as someone who was kind of rooting for Vettel this year, that's been tough, but that's a, a story for another time. Um, but I like the kind of racing where you can have those green flag runs, you have the green flag pit stops, and it's strategy that plays into it. The problem is if it doesn't end like that Kansas race did, where you know, with somebody making a mistake and somebody chasing them down, it's boring. So it's kind of hit or miss because I like the races that go like that. And you mentioned, Neil, that's kind of a racetrack that a true race fan can get into. They can be fun to sit down to watch and kind of see how that develops. But if you just kind of tune in like I did halfway through and nothing like we saw at the end happens now, that kind of saved it for a lot of people. Uh, if that doesn't happen, though, I think people kind of give it a 2 out of 10. Uh, Chase Elliott winning obviously saves it. Yeah, I think I think one thing that oh sorry I think one thing that that I think is underrated about this race and part of what kept especially the second half entertaining was how close the points battle was uh, for eighth. You had like you know Blaney who had run so well all day was up in the top five looked like he might actually point his way in and that was kind of exciting. Uh, and then you know he started to fall back and Almarola started to run better. Uh, you had or no who was it? it was Truex was hanging in there. You had Boyer running well. Uh, yeah, Almarola's locked in. Almarola. It's an Almarola. Uh, who's the other guy who was right down the bubble? Keslowski, but he Boyer. Boyer was as well. Yeah, yeah, Boyer. You know, it was just I thought that was interesting to see. You know how it would go back and forth, especially to see how Blaney started the day really in a huge hole, somehow dug his himself all the way out of it to where he was even with these guys, and then just barely missed it. You know, it was kind of tragic, but it was a tragic ending if you're a Blaney fan. And but you know, it was still it was entertaining to me. Yeah, Blaney was interesting. You know, it looked like he had a pretty strong car there in the beginning, but then once we got in those long runs, like it seemed like he was kind of pushing it a little too hard. He got into the wall a little bit there, and I was like, "Oh man, like, like, just take it easy." You, I mean, you just have to point your way in at this point. You don't have to win yet, but yeah, think, you know, unfortunately, doesn't make it. I think he treated it like a win, a must-win scenario all throughout the race when maybe that wasn't the smartest move. He might have been able to point his way in if he finished second or third because he was. I think he was just overdriving and trying to hang with Harvick and just couldn't. I actually want to take a second to talk about Eric Almarola because like I had mentioned, I had mentioned to the guys before we went live that um, I've been a displaced fan for the last few years and um, I just recently came back into the sport and watching regularly again. Um, Eric Almarola, from my experience, has always been – a driver who sits around like eh, 20th, 22nd, 18th in points, like right on the cusp of good, but kind of mid pack. And you come, uh, I come in and I see the, him in this top tier equipment doing this well. It's a true testament to how much a team can make a driver just as much as a driver can make a team. And uh, Eric Amaral running this well is a testament to the SHR equipment that we're showing right now. I mean, you have, um, I was, I think, I don't think Kurt Busch made it in, but or, no, he did. Um, uh, you have all four of the SHR teams in the top eight right now, and Eric Almirola proving he is a driver who's worth, who is worthy of this top tier equipment because he is a, a driver who can get results at the end. I, I've been saying for years, like way back, this is way back when Almirola was driving for them beginning in 2012. I said for years, Eric Almirola is good, but Richard Petty Motorsports is holding him back. I've been saying that consistently for years and I was extremely happy when he got his first career win, but it was rain shortened, unfortunately. So like some people were kind of like, Oh, it counts, but then it doesn't count. So it was finally good to see him win at Talladega. And it's just good to see him run consistent in general. I just, I agree. It is good to see a guy get a top ride and immediately thrive. in it. And I feel like too often with all of like the changing, you know, veteran drivers leaving young guys taking the place. Like it took Chase Elliott until this year, finally to win a race in Jeff Gordon's car. You know, that's, it, it's been slow going for a lot of guys switching rides like that, but it's nice to see Eric Almarola step into that car a few weeks into this season. He was leading laps. You know, that's something we hadn't seen from the 10 or Eric Almarola before. So that's kind of cool. Uh, I agree. He's a good story in this round that he made it this, that he's made it this far. Yeah, wasn't the last driver to win in the 10 car like Johnny Benson? It was. It was Johnny <laughs> Benson. Rockingham. I that out. I pointed that out on my Twitter right after the win. I looked up that stat, and I'm like, that's a cool stat. <laughs> I found <laughs> that. 2002, uh, Johnny Benson. Wow. Ultimate Jeez. Dragon would be proud. <laughs> Depending on when in 2002, the 10 hadn't won in my brother's lifetime. Oh, Ricky Rudd right. was the last person to do it before that. Uh, Ricky Rudd, uh, oh, it was November. Um, it was like one of the last races of the year. Okay, so my brother had been born at that point. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, okay, not the first time. Um, so are we pretty good so far? Um, well, actually, well, I mean, that's not the only racing we had because last night we had some eye racing action. That oh, yeah. talk about last night? Yeah, sure. We had our uh, our season finale for the, the NASCAR Peak Antifree Series. I don't know if anybody has followed it 
on like a week by week basis, but basically it's the top 50 guys on iRacing. It's a long time to get into it. You have to get like an, if you're familiar with it, you need an A level license. Uh, you need to qualify into the pro series. And then we run 16 races, but we also do a playoff. It's a little bit different. Um, eight drivers make it in. And then we have a four race round of eight. Uh, we cut the field down. And then last night it was our winner take all finale. Um, and it just so happened that it comes down to, you've got the top two guys on a little bit of a different pitch strategy, chasing each other down at the end. And uh, I think the, uh, the gap was like a second, um, coming across the line, but they were on each other's bumper going into turn three. Um, it makes, you know, our job easy commentating the races when it's tons of fun like that. So, uh, Ray Alfalo won the championship. I encourage you to go back and watch it anyways. Uh, so this is the fourth time he's won it. So over his career, he's won $40,000. And uh, if anybody's going to the Homestead race during the whole pre-show thing, uh, before driver intros, he'll be there. And the iRacing guys from the uh, the office will, and they'll give him their big check for 10000 bucks and his NASCAR championship ring and a trophy. Uh, it's been tons of fun. Um, I don't know what's going to happen next year. I know we had uh, Steve O'Donnell on the broadcast last night, so we got to talk to him. There's some things in the works that we can't really talk about yet, but next year is going to be the 10th year. Uh, that NASCAR and IRAC have been working together. So uh, we'll see what happens. I know over the uh, off season last year, Joe Gibbs Racing did a little series with us. Uh, so we had guys like uh, Christopher Bell, Denny Hamlin racing with us on a weekly basis. So I don't know if they're doing that again this year. If not, I guess I'll sit on my thumbs till February and see if uh, anything happens in between them. But if you haven't watched it, I encourage you to go. We talk about Kansas being a little bit of an iffy race. I don't think it's a hot take to say our race last night was tons of fun. If you haven't, you know, watched any of them before, uh, I highly encourage you to do so. It's tons of fun, and you guys, I mean, it's very easy to get involved in it too, which is uh, why I do it. Because otherwise, I'm, I mean, I'm, I suck at the sim, so I pretend to know what I'm talking about. But uh, it's cool, so I encourage you guys to go back and watch it if you haven't. And will it be on both the YouTube channel and the official website? It's everywhere. So okay. the, our kind of main broadcast is on YouTube, uh, just because the quality is good. Um, and I think like the YouTube has a couple thousand views, but it's also on NASCAR's Twitter, uh, on NASCAR's Facebook. It has like 130,000 views from last night. It's all, it's also on NASCAR's Periscope. So it's just kind of plastered everywhere. I'm just waiting for them to put us on TV. Oh, um, dude, I was saying that in the chat last night. I'm oh, sorry to cut you off there, but I was saying that in the chat last night. I'm like, look, if the NASCAR network is ever a thing, put iRacing on TV, you will get a ton of viewership, man. A ton of people will tune in just to watch that. Well, we, I mean, NASCAR really helped out because they were really engaged on the social media side of things. It, they just share it on Facebook and it gets like 100,000 views. So, you know, they were very engaged with us last night. Like I said, Steve uh, chatted with us. So I got to talk with him. Um, we've had other people from NASCAR talk with us over the course of the season. So if NASCAR kind of stays up on it, uh, I think it'll expose more people to it because they were, I mean, they were really into it last night and there were still people tweeting now, what is this? I haven't heard of it. So hopefully we kind of drill it into people's heads if they can stay up on it. And uh, like I said, so sign us up. We we'd love to have it on TV. More exposure, I think, is great. Peak has been our title sponsor now for four years. I know they're spending a ton of money now on the Formula One side of things, but that's a partnership that's going to keep going. So we'll see. The series gets bigger and bigger each year. Fantastic and how far it's come, too, in the last couple of years. Because I remember, like, a few years ago, a, couple of people, a lot of people were skeptical, like, on Reddit and stuff. But I'm glad to see that's uh, really taken off and becoming as big as it is. Yeah, I, th oh, I think Peaks had a big part of that. When uh, you get a title sponsorship, obviously, it kind of adds some legitimacy to it, in all honesty. Um, but, I mean, the racing's great. That's never an issue. Um, and, of course, esports, like, everywhere else are getting a lot bigger too i think the challenge we have is like all the other esports stuff that you see is really big it's you know first person shooters or those kind of games where people want to watch that because there's no real life equivalency to it so i think there is a challenge to convince people there's real race cars but come watch our virtual race cars and i understand that but i mean the racing's been great um, there's nothing else going on really much in the racing world on a Tuesday night, which is why it, it, it works for us. And, uh, you know, we're able to have NASCAR drivers join us from time to time. It's, it's a great time of the week, Tuesday nights, nothing that I'd, uh, I'd rather be doing. I hope they bring me back for a fourth year. We'll see you next year. Well, if you want to watch it in any capacity down in the link or in the uh, description below, there are links both to the iRacing website as well as their YouTube channel. So, 
you don't have any excuse not to watch it, everybody watching. Um, and really quick, uh, so Ray Alfala won the championship, and is that his fourth championship now in iRacing? It is his fourth. He won way back in 2011 and 2012, and those were his first two. And that's back when I was watching on YouTube, and I didn't get iRacing to race. I have a wheel, but it's broken, and I haven't really had much of an incentive to fix it. I was watching, and I said, well, I want to do those broadcasts. So I kind of got in, um, introduced maybe to sim racing, watching Ray Alfalo win. And then my first year commentating on the series was three years ago in 2016. He won his third title, uh, and he won his fourth last night. So he's the only driver to have more than one championship. And the guy that he ended up beating out by one spot, Ryan Luza, was our champion last year. He actually won in his rookie season, uh, mm -hmm. and he was trying to – kind of one up Ray and be the only other driver, not only to win one other or more than one title, but also go back to back and Ray wasn't having much of that. So those guys have healthy competition. We kind of had our own uh, big four, big three, if you will. Uh, but because we had, you know, the playoff format, uh, Matt Busa, who's somebody who's been racing in the series with us since 2013, he got his first ever win uh, at Atlanta a couple weeks ago that got him into the championship. So uh, it, it was tons of fun, but, Ray Alfalo is the best to ever do it. I mean, it's tight. Don't get me wrong. But, I mean, four championships. He's got four rings now. Uh, I mean, no, I don't know if anyone's going to touch that guy. He's got 25 wins in the series. So, I think that's 13 higher than anybody else. I mean, Dale Jr. won the first ever race in this series way back in 2010. So, his name's on the list of winners. But, now Ray's done a great job. And the one thing that, if I can mention, that I don't think a lot of people can really get exposure to, we don't have time on the broadcast to talk about it. Um, and even I don't fully comprehend it. These teams are huge. You know, you can only get so much out of the sim. But, I mean, all these teams, they have three, four drivers in this series. On top of that, they've got about four to five other drivers who are racing at an A-class license in iRacing. They just run hundreds of laps on the track the week before. And they've got legitimate telemetry software that they use to build their setups. In the sim itself, they have an actual person acting as a spotter and a crew chief. So... I mean, Ray gets the championship, and it's a tip of the hat to him, but uh, Slip Angle Motorsports is a great operation. They've got dozens of people behind him that 99% of people tuning in will never see. Mm, that's incredible. Yeah, I, also, I also have to ask this. I mean, you were talking about um, Ray Alfalo, you know, four-time champion and stuff. And, and um, in NASCAR, we've seen some guys, you know, get opportunities because they were so good at iRacing. I mean, Ty Majeski comes to mind. I mean, that's – he was uh, – he was – I. I think he was the best, uh, the best i racing guy in the um, in the entire world, and he um, got a ride. Um, My car. Yeah, yeah. Is, is there like anyone currently in that series right now that might be getting looks from like actual teams, or it's kind of like nah, like. Well, I think Ray needs to just based on the fact that he's, you know, done so good. But he is kind of the older side of things, and that's it's pushing. He's not old, but you know, a lot of the people are in their their teenage years, later teen years in this series. Um, we had the eNASCAR Ignite series over the course of uh, a couple of months also, and that was kind of more, I think, where NASCAR's looking. That was 13 to 16-year-olds driving, and uh, the driver who won that championship also got $10,000. But the big thing is uh, they were going to get introduced to the NASCAR uh, drive campaign, so they kind of get in with the executives, and uh, Max Pappas also partnered with us, so he's going to give the driver who won that championship uh, like a one-on-one -on -one instructional. But the peak guy, I mean, you just got to give him a shot. I know when Conti, uh, who was one of our drivers, Michael Conti, who was racing, when he won his championship back in 2014, he got to do one of the Richard Petty driving experience things. I know those cars are limited, so it's not, it's not the same thing. But I know Yahoo Sports featured that. If you, I mean, like it's the cliche that people who aren't a big fan of the sim racing stuff don't like, and I, and I get it. They're very different uh, disciplines. Uh, but you put those four guys that were in our championship race last night into a real car, let them race for a little bit. I've got no doubt that they can do something. The question is, you know, you need the support behind it. And that's where I'm encouraged based on our conversations with NASCAR this year, how much more is getting put into that. Wouldn't be surprised at all if something like that comes up. All right. See, I watched last night. It was the first, first race in a while I've watched. And I was really entertained. You know, I, I, I don't know if uh, anyone else on here wants to go as far as I will, but I honestly was more entertained with that than most of the cup race. And again, the cup race wasn't no. even that bad either. So I all agree with that. <laughs> yeah. Well, we had no commercials, so that's a plus. We, we yeah. 
two and a half hours <laughs> nonstop. So if, if you're on the anti-commercial train, come the on down one, and we'll talk your ear off. The last one that is not sponsored by Credit One Bank. It is not. No, maybe don't jinx it though. Well, maybe we'll have it next year. <laughs> the one flaw, there is one flaw of the series though, and I was like, man, you guys could have like done this way differently. You guys have playoffs. Why do you guys have playoffs, man? Just go. We don't consistent. have stage racing, so let's take the positives where we can get them. <laughs> um, we, we've only had the playoffs though for two years, so we held out. Um, um, we didn't even have a chase up until uh, the playoffs were introduced. I mean, we had not really. Like I said, ours is kind of a minor version where it's it's an eighteen race season. And the last five races of the playoffs, which is a good percentage of all the races. And then we have eight drivers. You go for four weeks, and then we cut it down. There's no stage racing. I don't make the rules. I think it's a good format because, like I said, uh, for Matt, who's been racing for five, six years now, to get his first win and to get a shot at the championship, that's the thing that I like about the playoff format. I think we still had the other three drivers who were the best, Ray Alfala and, of course, Ryan Luza. Those were the best guys all year. And then Michael Conti had been our best driver in the last two months. So the playoff format can absolutely take good drivers out of a shot at the championship. I think we were fortunate enough that it actually kept the two and three guys, I'd argue, that should have been it in there and added an extra guy in. So I've got no complaints. But uh, if, you, uh, if, you, if you don't like the format, if you want to stay like I am, and I, I don't want stages, but that's not my call. That's uh, it's well above no, my pay grade. Please, please don't. Let have my pay grade. I have. What's, what's the hate for stage them. races? Yeah, I like stages. You know? I don't. I don't mind them. Just our races yeah. are significantly shorter. Yeah, um, I can. No, I can understand it for y'all. Yeah, they're yeah. two hundred. I think every week's about two hundred and fifty miles, unless we're at like a, a Martinsville or something. We'll cut it a little bit shorter or, or a road course. So they're not, they're like Xfinity races. Yeah. You, if you're doing stages, they you wouldn't even be a green flag run through the first two. So I I think we're kind of in a spot where it works not having them. I mean, yeah, our race last sense. night barely had any yellows, and I thought it, it worked out great with the pit strategy and all that. So if don't don't fix it if it's not broken. That's what I would say. But, I mean, we're always rule. we're always looking. And when I say we, I mean the guys at NASCAR and iRacing are always working together. I know uh, we announced today that uh, Yusan Hamilton, who works with NASCAR, he is the senior manager of racing operations at NASCAR. So he's in the booth. Um, calling these races on a week-by-week -week basis in the tower. Uh, he was just named the uh, series director for the NASCAR Peak Antifree Series and that eNASCAR Ignite Series that I was talking about. So he's going to be a lot more involved. That means that NASCAR is going to be a lot more involved in how things are run. So we could see big changes for next year. Uh, but I chatted. We actually had Yusan also on a guest on one of our eNASCAR Ignite broadcasts. So NASCAR has been very generous, giving us their time uh, to talk with some of these higher-ups to get their thoughts. So I think Yusan's going to be great. He's been a member on iRacing for 10 years. So I think that whatever changes he implements now as the head uh, person overlooking all of this esports stuff, uh, I'm on board. I'm willing to uh, kind of go with whatever he says. I think that he's got good judgment. It's better judgment than uh, we've had the last few years in the Cup Series and top three I should take it to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, I think we can. I think this is a good time uh, to shift. But really quick before we do, uh, our guests might not know this. I don't think we told them before the show. Uh, we have a little tradition here, guys. In the chat, if you haven't already, 117 likes, only 38 likes. Lick the like button. We need a better ratio than that. Come on, get with it. Yeah, yeah, guys. We don't like the like button. We lick the like button here on this podcast. I saw you pushing that in the chat last night, so we appreciate it <laughs> on the broadcast. I caught that. I try to monitor it, but I can only do it so much. But <laughs> Yes, it is a, uh, a staple of the podcast. We've had it since the beginning. Um, so we have four races to go in Cup Series now. Uh, we've just reset the points, and if you guys are all cool with it and my mic holds out, I will read off the playoff standings really quick. If that's all good with you guys. Sure. Go ahead. Right. So above the cut line, Kyle Busch is plus 40, Kevin Harvick plus 39, uh, Martin Truex Jr. plus 23, and the last one currently above the cut line as we start the final round before the final race is Chase Elliott plus three. Now, the ones who are minus three, it is a three way tie between Kurt Boyer, Joey Logano, and Kurt Busch. So that cutoff line is very, very tight. And then minus 12 back to Almarola. So basically, that's that, that 
can change. Fourth through seventh can change with one stage, and Almirola could be up in the top four after two stages. So what are your guys' thoughts on that? Let me just say this. Um, you guys are – I know this is the final year of um, of his contract with Storehouse Racing, but y'all are sleeping on Kurt Busch here, man. I mean, y'all were sleeping on him during the regular season. He was consistent, but he just couldn't get that win, and he finally got it at Bristol, man. I, I don't know. Like, I know we'll, we'll go into picks later, but I think Kurt Busch, he's got a pretty good shot this weekend. I like Kurt Busch. He's been consistent, but Joey Logano has also been very consistent. They have the same – they're the same – both three points out right now. And if you look ahead to this round, Logano's got good history at Martinsville, at Texas, and at ISM. Kurt Busch, especially at Martinsville, is quite shaky. He's typically pretty good at Texas, but who isn't good at Texas? I feel like everyone loves Texas, at least old Texas. So I, I, I lean more towards Logano or maybe even you know a couple other guys before I look at Kurt Busch. But you're right. I think people aren't talking about Logano and Kurt Busch enough. Like even Eric Almarola, I know he's eighth on the grid, but everyone's talking about him because he just won. You know, we still get a little bit of talk about Clint Boyer, obviously Chase that, but like you're right. I feel like we forget about Logano and Kurt Busch, and I think at least one of them will probably make it into the. I think Logano's gonna make it in. I mean, spoiler alert, but yeah. Oh no, I I I, I never sleep on Logano ever. In fact, oh, I know again, you don't. Top three, top three talent. <laughs> yeah, you me, are. But like, you get. You else are. agrees with me? But I think that's what had, I think. I think we had talked earlier in the season, actually, like some point in the summer, maybe late spring. Um, that Legato was one of the more consistent ones out there, but because he hadn't had the amount of wins that the guys like the big three have had, people really overlook him. Because I think most of the summer leading up before the chase or playoffs, or whatever the hell it's called now, um, they he was right there with Kyle Busch, Kevin Harvick, Truex, etc. So, yeah, I think he's definitely overlooked. I, I, I don't know. These eight seem to be about the eight other than maybe Larson – who have run the best all year. So can I that, throw can I throw a little shout out to my boy Eric Jones? I know he got eliminated last round, but in this in this round of twelve, he finished fourth, eighth, and fourth. Eric Jones, if he didn't have that, if he didn't get caught up in that record at uh, Las Vegas, he could have been going to the final four. I'm telling you. I said I, I told you guys no, this. I, I, knew, I, told, I agree with you. Man, I told y'all this, but then all of a sudden he's just like the first round, he all of a sudden has a ton of stuff happen to him. I'm like, mm-hmm. really? The one time you have to be consistent. You were consistent all season up until that first round. Like, I come know. on. It come was on, tragic. Man. It was tragic. Anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there. <laughs> Don't make it any worse. <laughs> I want to throw this out there um, just to uh, strengthen the Joey Logano point. Um, the only other person that has a um, finishing average finish uh, in this entire season of less than 11 Besides Kyle Busch and Kevin Harvick is Joey Logano. He's sitting at a 10.7. He has a better average than Martin Truex Jr. He has more top 10s than everybody except Harvick and Busch. And he uh, has been only one of two drivers running at, uh, well, three drivers, have been running at the finish in in 30 of the 32 races so far. Nobody else is above 30. And the other two drivers are Daniel Suarez, who's out of the picture, and um, Eric Almarola. Mm -hmm. There we go. More I'll jump on the bandwagon. I buy it. I think that because of the playoff points, and I'm, I'm looking at them now with Bush, Harvick, and Turex being so far ahead, I mean, unless those guys rack out, which could happen, one bad race, you never know. I think Logano may be the best of the bottom five all season. Momentum's a big thing, so obviously Chase Elliott's going into a racetrack that he likes in Martinsville, but I think over the course of the year, I'd put Joey Logano as the best of the rest, and all you got to do is get to Homestead to get there, so... I mean, yet again, this is why this playoff format, I just, uh, you can call me old school. I just think it's bull. It just doesn't show who the best driver is. I mean, Logano, if we had a consistent (laughs) point system all season, Logano would probably, I think he was running right around uh, third, top three, top five in the standings. No problem. Fourth. uh, He would have been fourth tied with Kurt Busch and just a little behind your ex. Yeah, see? And that's exactly where he is now. 100% 100% agree with you. Um, I was talking about, we were um, sharing messages a couple of days ago, me and um, one, of the, one of the guys on Twitter. Um, I was basically saying this entire point system, um, not only does it, um, it doesn't reward consistency. When you can have 26 fantastic races and just bomb the last 10, you still had 26 consistent races, but now they don't matter anymore because you have to have good three race stints all in a row. And then the final race, you have to make that the best you've ever run all year just to win the championship. It doesn't reward the consistency like we saw back in past years before this whole elimination style came into play. 
So a lot of people are wasting, you know, good cars on um, pretty much not getting a shot. And um, another thing is when you change the system every year, and I was talking about this, I've talked about this for years. When you change the system every year, the reward of the system becomes arbitrary because it, cha it changes every year. It's like, oh, what are the rules going to be to win this next year? Oh, I have to follow these qualifications to get this reward this year. It just makes it kind of confusing for new fans, and then it just doesn't make it as special when you actually win it because it's not the same thing that you would have won 10 years ago. Jimmy Johnson, back in a couple of years ago when he won the title, um, had the lowest average finish of anybody who had ever won the title, an average finish below 14th. So um, let's take that into consideration. That's that's the problem I have with this elimination style playoff. I miss the playoffs, like the chase. I thought, like I, I understand the backlash to the idea in general, and like under this format, you could win the first thirty-five races, finish second, and not win the championship. So I, I get that, and it, listen, it's fun to watch. But I completely agree with the point that to be able to win the championship year, you know, one year, and then for it to change the other year. It, I mean, you have to have polarity between championships. And I don't think that it's right that we have to put asterisks next to every couple of years to say, well, this championship was one like this. This one was one like that. So I get that. I missed the 10 race chase. I thought that that was an okay balance. You split it off and, and you get that. You can make your commercials and you can draw the people in for those final 10 weeks. But at the same time, I think 10 weeks is enough where consistency can prevail while also giving drivers a second chance. You have a cruddy start to the season. You can do something with it. So I thought the 10 race thing was perfect. The playoffs are fun to watch now. I'll admit that. But maybe the purist in me wants to find a middle ground and say I liked it better when it was the 10 race chase. I 100% agree with everything you just said, Evan. That is basically my 100% stance on the playoffs. You yeah, All right, like, hey, oh, You're my favorite guest we've ever had. Oh, my really goodness. Quick, <laughs> really quick. So back to Eric. I noticed that little clap back you did there with um, when I said, oh, Logano would have been this. but And you said, you're oh, he's, he's fourth right now. But Exactly. Like, no, but if something <laughs> happened to Logano in the first round, then he's out of the first round, kind of like Eric Jones and stuff. I mean, well, yeah, yeah. He's, he's there right now and stuff. But still, I mean, something could have happened, I think he would have been out. I think this current playoff format somehow manages to be both the most forgiving format and the most unforgiving format. To some people, like I'll throw Eric Jones or even Brad Keselowski's name in there, it's been unforgiving. They had like two bad races and they're out and you know, they ran pretty well all year. But for other people, for other people, and we've seen this in years past, I'll use Keselowski's name again. In years past, he's been one of the best drivers. He's had one bad race, which in the old 10 race playoff format, you can, if you had one race where you finished outside the top 20 besides Talladega, throw Talladega out there. If you'd had another race where you finished outside the top 20, you were eliminated from, the, from winning the championship. Basically every yeah. single year that was the case. In this current playoff format, you can have a bad race. You know, you can blow an engine one, one race and win the next race and you're still locked in. Or I like the current playoff format because of the stages. This is part of why I like stage racing, at least in the Cup Series, is because it rewards bonus points and more than anything rewards playoff points for winning stages and winning races. And I think that's super important because right now, you know, Martin Truex Jr. almost got eliminated this last round because he wrecked at Dover, and uh, I don't remember what happened to him at Talladega, but he didn't run well at Talladega. I don't remember he what happened. He just didn't run well. He just didn't yeah, run well. He just had two bad finishes in a row, and he almost missed out despite having all those playoff formats. But there you go, two bad races in a row, and we're still, still talking about Martin Truex Jr. as a championship favorite. And that's because I think this current format, better than it did three years ago when they first kind of started doing this playoff format, this current version does reward consistency well enough, I think, to appease most fans. Obviously, the, the the old school fans who really liked the 2003 and earlier format still aren't fully happy, and that's I, I get that. I understand that completely. But I do. I think this current playoff format is the second best one we've had since 2004. I would still say like the 2004 version probably was my favorite. Uh, but I think this current one is okay. I agree completely with what you guys said about like how NASCAR needs to stop changing every five years. I think that's 100% accurate. I think they need to stick basically with what they have right now for at least the next five years. If we get the racing better, if like Gen 7 car comes out and the mile and a half racing is really good and fans are coming back just for those races, then sure, we can go back to a simple playoff format and appease the old school fans. But right now, NASCAR needs a couple gimmicks. They need the Roval. They need a few more restrictor plate races, and they need a, a, a flashy playoff system to attract viewers these days. That's, 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 that's what, that's what they need. And that's what they're doing, I guess. And it's working for now. Once the racing product gets better, I hope they, you know, maybe they'll change it. We'll see. I'm going to say my favorite um, uh, instance of the chase was probably when they did what they did in 2007, 2008, where they seeded you based on your number of wins. So they did reward your wins, but they had 12, which is a, you know, a good amount. If you're in the top 12, you're not necessarily bad. It gives you a second chance to like save your season. 
and um, it basically gives you that 10 race. I'm, I'm going to quote what one of you said. Um, gives you that 10 races to show, okay, this is what uh, my season's about. I'm not going to let the first 26 races dictate me. I'm here to win a championship. We saw it with Clint Boyer back in 2007. Um, came in the chase, never won, won a race in his life. And then wins the first race, chase opener, ends up winning third, uh, getting third in the stand, the final standings, even though he had been kind of like a fifth, sixth, seventh place driver all year. Um, so that just shows it basically you can save your season or you can wreck it then in those 10 races, but it does reward consistency. It rewards wins. It was a perfect balance. And I feel like we're balanced a little bit too much to the wins uh, at this point where it doesn't reward consistency hardly at all. Well, I'm, I'm thinking that. We're, we're going to have this format next year for sure. Like, yeah. I don't think we're changing it. I think especially with the uh, turmoil of NASCAR's CEO situation, I don't think they're really focused right now on, oh, hey, we need to do a new point system. Um, but and, and, and it doesn't really fit into the cycle. Because we had the, let's see, the 04 to 06, we had three years there. 07 to 10, had four years there. Had 11 to 13, that's another three. 14 to 16, that's another three. 17 to 19, maybe? Another three? So, I mean, I, I don't know. We the, the chase format has had sort of four different iterations. And it can be split into two, but I sort of split it into to the f four previous ones in this one. I, I don't know if they keep it the same, though. That's the problem. It's like, I think a big problem with, with the chase playoffs as well. And I don't think it's as much. And again, I don't. I don't. I'm not a big enough fan of the chase playoffs. I'd be fine if it was just ten drivers, ten races, whatever. I think that one of the biggest problems that a lot of us neglect to look at is that we really don't have enough time to look at these formats and get comfortable with them. When we're two years in already, and we're like, well, we don't know. Like, when oh, let's change, change it. Let's change well, it up. Well, it's it just. I think, and, and on top of that, as I'm saying that. We're already talking when the next change will be. Can you tell me any other major sport of the big five sports, you know, NFL, MLB, NHL, NBA? Can you tell me which one of them were, are we asking with any of those? What are we having the next uh, overhaul for the championship? Well, some actually, people, the, uh, some actually people in the NBA want to combine the conferences, but it's just because the bad idea. sucks. Yeah. It's a bad idea. Hey, the well, NBA already has a new uh, playoff thing. They just give it to the Warriors every year. <laughs> so I guess that's wrong. technical. <laughs> but yeah. Well, there, therein presents the problem. Um, when you don't even have enough time to think about, oh, that's how this works. Oh, we're changing it again. But therein lies the problem. Yeah, you mentioned NBA. NBA has only had one change. Uh, NASCAR has now gone through four cycles, and possibly five if you count the original. And, um, Therein is, is basically lies the problem is I actually forgot the point I was trying to make there. I'll come back to it in a minute. But um, that's basically the issue there. It, it, it just, just changes every year. Nobody can get used to it. You're not attracting any new fans, and you're kind of driving away the floor, uh, the, uh, the fans who have been with the sport for a while, like myself. Um, but, yeah, that's pretty much what I want to say. And also, let me just point this out. We are missing out on some legit points battles, even from this year. Jarrett, tell them the point standings for the Xfinity series right now. Well, I'll do the Because they're close. The Cup isn't as good as the Xfinity. So the Cup, uh, Kyle Busch is ahead of Hardwick by 16. I'll preface this because everyone always freaks out every time I talk about it. Yes, I know they would have raced different. It's just a hypothetical. Anyway, Kyle Busch would lead Kevin Hardwick by 16 this year. Now the Xfinity, that one's more entertaining. There are five drivers currently within a race of points lead. Christopher Bell, even after the penalty, is up by eight over Hemmer. Or no, no, Christopher Bell now is up eight over Hemmer. They just changed it today on here. Um, 20 back to Justin Allgaier, 28 back to Cole Custer, 30 back to Elliot Sattler. So. Pretty close. Mm -hmm. Without playoffs, I'm trying to find the. I, I might have deleted it. I, I made a note on my phone, um, where I copied down. I think I might have deleted it, which I'm kind of upset about now, because uh, I'm going to do a video soon on it. Every point system NASCAR has ever had, and don't get me wrong, I don't think this Chase playoff system. You know, I don't like it. I don't think it's the smartest one ever. I, I no way is it the worst system they've ever had. No, yeah. like they used to. There used to be a system where, and I think this was the 60s, I want to say, 
where they would reward points based on laps finished. <laughs> Work track, you get point two. And then that was an accomplishment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. good point. But, but it's like you get point two five points a lap for a short track race. And that's like one mile, you get half a point, and then 0.75 for mile and a half to one mile, and then like bigger than two miles, I think you got like one, like two or three points a lap or something. I didn't know that. I it, did not know that. Weird, man. I, I wish I could find it. I'm, I'm really upset that I deleted that notepad because, or that note, because it, it is. It's really, really weird, but at the same time, it's one of those things where it's like, it, it's kind of odd looking back. So in no way is this, they also used to do it off of reward money. Like whoever got the most reward money would get the most points in a race. It was, mm. it was incredibly odd. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, there's nothing really we can do about it other than give our opinions, let the people in the chat decide what they think about it. And since we have this format and since we have already talked about it, shown who is in the top eight right now. I only think it's fair that we give our picks for who's going to be the four at Homestead at this point. Cause I think we've done this now every, what do you call it? Every, every time we round. So oh, yeah, who, that's right. first? who, who are your guys' picks? I'm pretty sure at least two of them are going to be the same for everybody. So what are your guys' picks for, uh, for the final four as my dog is screeching. Parking back? I'll go first. Um, um, so I think it's pretty obvious that, well, um, two of them, they're not in there. Uh, Larson, who is my championship pick, based on how he was running uh, before the playoffs started, he's out in the second round, and Jones is out in the first round. So um, both Kyle Busch and Harvick stay the same. Now, here's my other two. I'm going to say um, Kurt Busch and Joey Logano make the mm -hmm. final four. I don't know. Like, I, I, I don't know. Like, I kind of was – debating oh either chase elliott or logano either make it and stuff but i don't know like yeah this is the playoffs but you still have to be somewhat consistent because not everybody can win so you have to be somewhat it it, it does a uh, it does reward some consistency um not a whole lot but some is there so for that i gotta pick kurt bush and logano along with kyle bush and kevin harvick and did did you think about like Truex at all, because that's what made my predictions hard is Truex has not been running as well as usual last few weeks, but he is still, he's got a 20 point cushion. Like, no, I, I still, I, I thought he was going to be out of the, I mean, it looked like he was going to be out of the round of 12 there for a little bit. I mean, true. I don't know. I mean, I we're going to Martinsville. A lot of stuff happens down there. I mean, Texas and mm -hmm. not so much in, in Phoenix mm -hmm. and it's proven over the, since the playoff format, um, since this um, current playoff format that, you know, a lot of stuff can happen in Phoenix as well. So, no, I didn't really think about Truex, honestly, um, for the Final Four. Mm -mm. Well, I, I'll say I at least thought about him because, you know, while I don't think he has been running that well, that he's got a 23-point lead already, which I think is significant, and he's decent at some of these tracks coming up. Um, but that being said, I, I made a video earlier today about my Final Four. Some of y'all uh, in the chat might have already seen it, so I'll go quick. Uh, Harvick and Kyle Busch, I think, are good. They're going to be in. They already have more, almost a whole race worth of points ahead of fifth already, so they're good. Uh, third, I think Chase Elliott, I think those two wins in this last round were huge. If he didn't get those two wins and get those 10 extra points, uh, I probably wouldn't pick him to move on, but those 10 extra points go a long way, in my opinion. So I think Chase Elliott uh, will be the third guy in. And fourth, I'm going with Joey Logano. I kind of want to go out with – kind of have one kind of out on a limb pick, and I feel like Logano is that guy because, like like we talked about at the beginning, you know, we, nobody's really been talking about Joey Logano that much this year. He's just kind of quietly been the third or fourth best player like most consistent car and every year in the playoffs feels like there's one guy that sneaks his way in on uh on just on points alone and Logano could be that guy this year so Harvick Bush Kyle Bush uh Elliot and Joey those are my uh those are my four all right I'll put my four in so Kyle Bush and Kevin Harvick I think they're too far ahead right now and I don't see of Clint Bo of of Chase Elliott Clint Boyer Joey Logano Kurt Busch Eric Amarola, I don't see them getting all three races with different drivers. So those two, I think, are mine that are set. Uh, I'm going to go Chase Elliott, too. I think he has the hot hand right now. And then I swear I'm not doing this. Like I, I've, I've thought about this for a while. I'm not doing this to uh, go along with anyone. But I'm going to put Joey Logano as well for consistency. I think 
his team is just that little bit better, in my opinion, than Kurt Busch. And I think that Truex is on his way down. I think Almirola's team is a year away. And Boyer's hot and cold. So I, I can't trust Boyer, I don't think, as much as I could trust Logano. Three weeks from now, I could be completely wrong. So, yeah, that's my picks. Kyle Busch, Kevin Harvick, Chase Elliott, and Joey Logano. Um. I'm pretty much there with you. I don't see the consistency of late from Truex and um, from the others. Uh, and they just have to really uh, come into a bit of like a spark in the next few races. I think if there's one guy that could um, uh, um, like usurp those those top four, Kyle Busch, Kevin Harvick, Chase Elliott, Joey Logano, um, who are my four picks. I think if there's one that could do it, um, my dark horses for that are um, Eric Almarola or... Um, mm -hmm. Possibly Clint Boyer if, because he's got a couple of good tracks coming up. But um, honestly, those are my main five. Those are kind of the five that, based on statistics alone, are in a league of their own. But, you know, anything could happen. Kyle Busch and Kevin Harvick can both have bad races and be out of it completely. Uh, that's the product of this chase. And the prodigal son has returned. Danny is in. What is up? I What's up, man? Before I joined on, I caught that you all was kind of giving some uh, play, some uh, final four predictions. Yep, yeah. What you got? All right, so I got for the final four, Kyle Busch, Kevin Harvick, Brad Keselowski, and <laughs> wait, <laughs> wait, no, no, sorry, I don't know why I said that for. I got... <laughs> that. This week, been, not last I've been, week. I've been, it's been a long day, huh, Danny? Yeah, it has been a long time. I meant Chase Elliott. I have no clue why I said Brad Keselowski. as nothing. Okay, closely. look alike. <laughs> Joey Logano. Wow. He is with us. So is that four people that all have the exact same Final Four is on here? Well, it's going to be completely wrong. Wow. No, we got to hear what Evan has to say. Yeah. Oh, I've just been looking at the numbers while you guys have been going over it. I, I don't want to bet against Truex. I've just learned better in the last couple of years. And I think that, you know, Bush and Harvick are pretty mm. much a lock. They're 40, 39 points ahead. You could wreck out of two races and still be in a decent spot. The question is that fourth spot. And again, if, if there was no win and you're in, I'd be willing to be a little bit more confident. But I mean, you talk about guys that are hot or cold. I mean, Clint Boyer could have a good race and win. We've seen Almarola put himself in position. I still think Logano's the best of the rest, but looking at who's left, you've got Bush and Turex and the two Toyotas. I think they're in. I don't think Stuart Haas is going to be able to keep it up with four teams spreading out those resources. So I think Harvick in the lead is good. And I think Chase Elliott has a good shot because he's the only Chevrolet left. They're still behind but they've been getting better. That team specifically has been getting better. And Hendrick is going to throw everything they have at that nine car. And as long as he doesn't get racked out, I think he'll be able to go in despite the fact that he's only, you know, three points ahead of three other cars. The winning your end thing. It's, it's a, it, I mean, I think if somebody's going to win a race from those bottom four, Boyer, Logano, Bush, Almirola get in, it happens this weekend at Martinsville. If one of those drivers don't win, I think it's the top four right now. It's it's Bush, Harvick, Truex, and Elliott. I was wondering they, if anyone was going to pick Truex because I would have been shocked if nobody here put Truex in. I, I you know I guess it's the whole time I've just been thinking something's going to happen to Truex and he's not going to make it. I guess it's just I have it stuck in my head this entire time. But I guess I guess you're right. I mean you know even though they've been slacking, that team could easily go out and win Texas. They they've won at Texas in the past. They uh, didn't they even sweep it last year? No, no, sorry, no, no. Harvick won it last year, but still, they 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 did win the other Texas race. You know, they could easily go out and get it done there. Yeah, it's possible, but you know, I think right now the way it sits, if I you know I wait until my I wait until actual predictions to confirm it or not. But I mean, looking at it right now, you got could easily see Elliott, Truex, and Harvick winning the next three races, and Kyle Busch should be locked. Well, and here's something that uh, I think a lot of us are sort of neglecting to look at is we're sort of treating Phoenix ISM, whatever you want to call it, as the Phoenix ISM we've had since 2011, late 2011. We had a new configuration. While it's not that much different, it still throws that little bit of a monkey wrench into uh, the overall plans for all the crew chiefs, for all the drivers. Could that be a race that maybe we're overlooking as a wild card race? 
Oh, I'm not. I'm not overlooking that. I, I said I've in the beginning, like that ISM that, race is going to be interesting. I've just noticed that, like, especially especially on Twitter, like everybody is already giving it to Harvick. And while that might be the smart thing because that team is very good at adapting right now, I mean, for all we know, this could be his Achilles heel. And if he doesn't win those two races before, then maybe he struggled. Like, look at 2014. He had to win that race because he struggled at uh, Martinsville. He crashed out. What happens if that happens now and suddenly he goes from 39 above to nine above with two races left? And now that track is not his bread and butter anymore. So, And that track in the past couple of years, we've seen drivers that, you know, would be ordinarily overlooked, you know, be the ones to be the, the biggest people there. You know, Matt Kenseth won last year out of the playoffs. And then, and then two years before that, Alex Bowman just, just so supposed to just be there. Was looking like he could win the race, so you know anything's possible there. And then Dale Jr. won in fifteen, who and he was already. Oh winning. yeah, yep. Edwards won in thirteen. He wasn't part of the championship fight at that point, so mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's. I don't know. I don't. I don't want to say anything's done before it's done. That's why I'm so unsure about my picks, mm -hmm. other than those top two. But even those, that that's just how topsy turvy the system is. Is that that you know they can realistically be gunning for fifth once they get to homestead that's why i like this round or the the schedule is because you start with the craziness at martinsville but then even if you get something screwy happens there you got two pretty typical ovals to try and build yourself back up so i do well, like that texas was a good race this spring yeah you know? it's it's a one groove it's a track where you get slip out of that one lane you're going to spin out so you know we had a big wreck here in the in the spring race so you never know at texas i guess I will say this, you know, that fourth driver, you know, I'm thinking either Logano or Truex, but just the three that same that three that seem like they will be there is Bush and Harvick and then, you know, hey, that nine that nine team pulled it together at the at the end of the season and they've really got that kid going where he needs to be. And, you know, if, if he gets to the final four with four wins, then that's actually Actually, what I expected in, in my preseason predictions, I kind of said that he would get four wins and make it to Homestead. Well, he'd get there. So, Chase Elliott, this do is for you. You know, what's crazy is that Chase Elliott, you know, already three wins and stuff, and average finish in, I believe, the 10th, 10s or 11s, something like that. And I still believe that Hendrick Motorsports, they're still, like, fixing some things over there and stuff, right? It's not as good as it used to be, you know what I mean? And he's already, you know, winning three races and he's also in some people's title talks too so once that once once they get that team that whole organization really back on track um in a way because i i feel like they're on the right path but they're not still they're they um they still haven't fully um fully um figured out what the problem is yet um with the rest of their teams and stuff once that team is is like officially back then chase elliott i mean it's not going to be a surprise if he wins like two or three championships down the road Chase Elliott in the last, um, what is it, 13 races now, 12 or 13, uh, 13 races since the, 14 races since Kentucky. Um, Chase Elliott has only finished out of the top uh, top 15 twice, and that was Las Vegas where he crashed out in Talladega, and that's, I don't even count Talladega half the time. So so really quick, um, Eric, um, he has to hop off here in a little bit, so um, if you want to really quick do your uh, outro and stuff, then uh, yeah, okay, go ahead. Who's yeah, your sorry, guys. this weekend? Just, oh, who's, who's my win pick? Yeah, just do the win pick. We can oh, do gosh. the best one. Um, for Martinsville, I'm going to say Chase. I think Chase wins two in a row, three out of four. I think he does it. Uh, but, yeah, sorry, guys. I do have to hop off early, unfortunately, tonight. Most Wednesdays I'm free tonight. Unfortunately, I have a commitment uh, that, that I have to fulfill. So I apologize for that. Uh, it's been fun talking to our two guests, though, this week, Tendigo and Evan. Uh, how's, how do you say it? Pas Pasoko? Pasoko. Yeah, it's a tricky one. You got it. Yeah, I got you. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's been really great uh, talking to you guys. Hopefully you guys have a great rest of your show. Uh, I'll try to watch a little bit while I'm getting ready to leave. So, uh, yeah, have a good one, everyone. I'll see you guys next week for the uh, for the entirety. should be fun. All right. All right. See you later. Bye, Bye Eric. Just wait for him to go. And now we can talk bad about him. All right. No, so, so actually, here's what, here's what we did. I just had him do the ha first half, and I got here for the second half. So I'm I'm, ta I'm tagging in. <laughs> it's like a uh, it's a race of podcasting. Um, <laughs> yeah. Should we just hop on into picks really quick, and then we can just go into some of the different news that's popped up? 
this week. Yeah, there hasn't there hasn't really. Wow, this is the quickest we've hopped into picks. There hasn't been any news really this week, but, has there? I mean, there's been a little bit, but it's nothing that really is. No, like, we do our noteworthy news before our picks, and there's really nothing super noteworthy. Mm-hmm. So, uh, for our guests, really quick, what we do each week is we pick who's going to suck, who's an underdog, and then who's going to win. Um, who you want me to just go to first, or who wants to go first? I'm cool if you go first. Okay. All right. My pick for who's going to suck, because I am a daily watcher of Out of the Groove. Shameless plug. Um, my pick for who's going to suck based on his past at uh, Martinsville is Kurt Busch. I think Kurt Busch is going to struggle in this race, and I think it's going to make the rest of this round a must win. Not disrespect. I can't believe you. You you really just said that, dude. Wow. Wow. Okay. Okay. Anyways. Anyways. So um, my my uh my who's gonna suck pick. Um, mm, I have to say Eric Amarola here. I don't know. I don't know. Martinsville hasn't really necessarily been his place i guess maybe that's because he was running and and not the best equipment before but i don't know eric amarola at martinsville this week um i, I don't think he'll crash out but i think he'll probably get around a uh, let's say maybe like a, a top 15 at least you know something like that I, I don't know like even though he's driving in storehouse equipment i don't know about this weekend though okay for mine I'm going to also say a Stuart Haas driver, but probably the last one you'd expect. It's actually a guy who won here in the spring. We've got different circumstances coming into this weekend. And motors on the line. And way different weather-wise, for sure. When we were there last time, it was like 30-something degrees, snow on the ground. And and this time around, it's you know it's it's chilly. Not near as it was. So you're going to have a little bit different track conditions. So I'm not going to see Clint Boyer having having as good of a run as he did last time, obviously. Hmm. All right, so um, well, well, which one of you guys want to go next? Uh, I'm still kind of thinking on mine, but I mean, I can just throw something out there because um, I'm just, just trying to think of statistics and um, who just has the worst overall history of Martinsville. And considering the circumstances, um, even though his pass at Martinsville isn't isn't you know the, the worst in the world? It's actually pretty good. I'm gonna go out on a bit of a limb and say Martin Truex um, for who's gonna suck this week. I don't necessarily think he's gonna suck. I just think with all the things that have, you know just come up in the last few weeks, morale's down, um, and his performance has not been a good, as good lately. I'm just gonna say that he might uh, stick to how he's been running the last few weeks. Martin Truex uh, maybe will finish in the top twenty, but not in the top ten. See, he was almost my pick, and the only reason I didn't do that is just because I considered, you know, I consider, you know, he he's never he's never got a short track race win. That's something to always consider with him. But I remembered how he did in the fall race last year because I was at that one. And I mean, he got second in that one, so that was the biggest reason I didn't I didn't want to go with him. I'm gonna pony back on that. I'm gonna go with Truex. Also, I was just looking at his numbers because I was curious. Uh, he has an average finish at Martinsville nearly at 20th, and he's hit or miss. I mean, he finished fourth and second in the last two races. Um, it, it's either he's a top five car or he's 20th. And I think that it's it, – he's still in my championship four, uh, but I think it's going to be one of those 20th races. All right. Now, since we all have our sucky picks, let's do our underdogs. Now, I'm going to cheat here because of how this guy's been doing all year. I'm going to cheat because I know that technically if this was any other year, really, he wouldn't be an underdog based on the numbers career wise. And based off of how poorly he's been this year, I think you all know where I'm going with this. My underdog for a win this week would be Jimmy Johnson. Uh, no, it's still crazy. It's just crazy. It's crazy that he's an underdog, but I mean, even in their careers, Earnhardt and Petty were underdogs. You know, Gordon was an underdog at one point. I mean, 2015, when he won, that was an underdog win. So I, I say, why not Johnson as an underdog? He This might be the weekend where he gets that win and can make it a perfect streak with Chad Canals of winning every year they're together. I think this is his last best shot at a win with Canals. Uh, 
I don't know. I mean, Johnson, uh, yeah, don't get me wrong. You know, he's – Martinsville, man. It's Martinsville uh, and Jimmy Johnson. You know what? I mean, it's just – it's either – He can't win anywhere. It's here in Dover. I mean, it's either – I mean, it's, man, it's just a toss-up between Hamlin and Johnson for me. You know, Hamlin, he has had – you know, he has had its moments this season, but for the most part, this has really been his worst season ever, which is – I guess it's saying a lot because even though he's made the playoffs, it's still his worst season. That's how good he's been. But yeah, you know, I I, I can't go against Johnson here. I, I just can't. You can't do that. Um, not only is that just disrespectful, not to just put him in like any sort of thing when it comes to Martinsville or, or whatever. But you know, based on one bad season, though, even though this is the worst season of Johnson's career, you can't go against him at Martinsville. You can't go wrong with him there. Like even in the Martinsville race in the in the spring, he got a top ten which was bad by his standards because he's been so dominant there. Um, but, yeah, Johnson, definitely uh, my underdog pick for sure. All right, so my underdog, um, he's been low-key, a really good short track racer this year. Um, Martinsville, earlier this year, he got seven. Bristol in the spring, he got fifth. Bristol in the fall, he got eighth. Um, the two Richmond races, uh, I think he got, like, had a little bit of a bad one in the spring. He got 18th, and then fall he got 12th place. But overall, fairly decent short track program. So he's out of the playoffs now. He doesn't really have anything else he can and can't do. So Alex Bowman, underdog to maybe get another top five, maybe even more than that. Oh, really quick. Um, I misspoke. I said Hamlin's worst season has been this year. Sorry, 2013. I even did a video on it. So sorry. This is his second worst season. My bad. Shame. I know, shame on me. What are uh, your guys are are your guys is under? Yeah, ten to go. What's yours? Um, I kind of took mine. I was actually gonna go with Alex Bowman, but uh, you know what? I'll just go the same one you got, Alex Bowman. Um, just because I was looking up stats, impressive short track stats. Um, I uh, finished seventh in Martinsville, and he's um been relatively consistent this year. You know, not great or anything. He's out of chase, got nothing to lose, uh, but a lot to prove. Alex Bowman's my pick for underdog. I've been looking at numbers, kind of trying to think through this one. I wanted to say Kurt Busch just because he hasn't been good at Martinsville, so why not? You know, just go out there and have a good race. I mean, nothing's stopping him from doing it. They've got the resources. I think everyone's going to have one race that clicks. I was going to say Bush. I'm not going to. I was going to even say as well that you could consider some other drivers, but I have to agree with Jimmy Johnson. It, you can't. You can't not say him at Martinsville. That's a racetrack where some of those little things that maybe Hendrick and Chevy's been behind on this year aren't as big of a factor. And I would not at all be surprised if uh, he's up there specifically uh, this week at Martinsville. And it's weird. I agree with you guys. You can't call Jimmy Johnson an underdog, right? I don't think anyone's really talking about him. So I'll be the boring one to go with the group, and I'll agree with the 48. And real quick, one driver... It just dawned on me. So, you know, I'm going to pick for Eric. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, he didn't say an underdog. I'm going to pick for Eric's underdog. Uh, Eric's underdog is AJ Allmendinger. That dude actually ran really oh. well here in the spring. No, no, no. No, I don't care. He, he beats himself everywhere he goes. No way. Not even an underdog. I don't care. No. <laughs> just don't do it. No, I don't want AJ Allmendinger to win this weekend just to make Darian mad. Well, I'm not going to get mad if he wins. Hell, I picked Suarez to win Talladega. I mean, you can, you can, I mean, I mean, you can, you can wish him to win all, all you like, but I mean, it's not going to happen. I mean, he's not even going to finish in the top 20. Come on now. Just watch Ryan Newman win. Just watch that happen. <laughs> I could see that. I, I think that that's a way better. He has a way better shot than Almond Digger. I, I didn't say he's gonna win. I just said he's gonna run pretty good. He no, but, but then Jared's all like, "Oh, I hope he wins just to trigger Darian in there." I <laughs> I'm not. I am not. You know, I'm not above saying that. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna look really quick. I do have another good one though. I'm just not gonna say it because I already picked mine. Just kidding. I didn't pick for Eric. Don't take that literally. And I oh yeah. AJ Allmendinger finished eighth in the last race here. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. For, well, for Mr. Oh, he's not going to even finish in the top 20. And if I recall, he was running like more or less like third, like majority that day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He was in contention to win towards the end. And he just, they, I think they stayed out or something. So he didn't have as good a time. And what happened? He beat himself like always. 
He, he beat himself again. What his crew chief decides. Well, his crew chief beat him. How? Your crew chief is supposed to help you win, and he beats you. That's how bad Alma Digger is, man. His crew chief is so bad, he's beating himself. About Dale Jr. and Lance McGrew, Mr. Dale Jr. fan? Huh? Would you say the same about Dale Jr., seeing that Lance McGrew was the same way? Yeah. I don't know. That, well, they were both bad that year. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just yeah, a bad combination. I guess. Here to Kyle Bush, almost beating Kyle Bush when he won after being middle of the top 10 all day. So, I mean, as well, great. One second place finish. Oh, well. Second place, a sixth place, an eighth place. All right. He's good. <laughs> Come on, He's man. all right, but I don't know. Mr. Stats is going against this, I take it. Kind of. <laughs> exactly. I guess. All right, so really quick, guys, 139 and 39 people watching, but only 65 likes. Make sure to lick that like button, everyone. Yeah, lick the like button. Not um, acceptable for that many viewers and not enough likes. Mm -mm. <laughs> well, I'm ashamed. Eric picked Chase Elliott. My pick is going to be really outside the box. He has a hot – no, it's Chase Elliott. I'm picking Chase Elliott. He was good here last year. He has a hot hand right now. He is – the Hendrick heir to Jimmy Johnson, I'd say, is the dominant Hendrick driver. And he's shown it at Martinsville. I'm going to be boring and pick Elliott two weeks in a row. And I am gonna. I already can hear that Martinsville crowd cheering. Let's keep it consistent. I already said it. This dude's for you. Chase Elliott, two wins in a row, four for the year. Yeah, so really quick, just to make it easier on everyone, let's just, let's just get the Chase Elliott picks out of the way before mine because I'm not picking them. But do we have any I other – Hmm? Neither am I. I want to oh. pick him, but I don't want to go with the group. So if I have to do a hot take, I'll say Logano. But I really say Chase Elliott's going to win. Okay. Do, All right. Do a hot take. I'm picking Kyle Larson. Oh. Ooh. His, stats, Ooh. his stats here are impressive. He's a mm. good short tracker. He finished, uh, which, uh, what was it? I think it was um, uh, Martin Slade finished 16th this year, but um, he's done well there in the past. And then. He's been doing really good short tracks. Bristol, he finished second earlier this year. Richmond, seventh. And then the other Richmond race, um, he finished seventh as well. I'm picking Kyle Larson. He's got great stats at short tracks. He's a great short tracker. And he's been developing into a very mature driver lately. And he's got nothing to gain or lose, too. And exactly. his, uh, his, his sponsor is the race sponsor. And take risks. He can afford risks. All right, so that just, I mean, that just uh, leads me, I guess. Um so, no, Chase Elliott's not my pick. I think he'll run good, but I don't think he's going to win. Um, Logano, um, um, Evan picked him. Um, again, I think he'll I think he'll, uh, I think he'll, he'll run good there, but, no, I don't see that happening. And Larson, I, I don't know. No, he's not going to win. <laughs> like, I don't know. His team is just really inconsistent. Um, one guy's been consistent all year pretty much, but he's really only had one win, which is at a short track, by the way. Granted, it's different, but still, it's still a short track. Uh, Kurt Busch, for sure, I believe is going to win this weekend. I definitely like Kurt Busch here. And, yes, historically, eh, Kurt Busch hasn't been the best year and stuff. But, you know, he did win in 2014 as well, you know, before. So he does have one grandfather clock. And mm, it's just he's the been The only time he's ever finished top five there, too. His average finish is 21st at Martinsville. So that's why I said he was my underdog, because why not? But it's bold. I'll give you that. Ooh, his average finish is 21st there? I didn't know it was that bad. He's better yeah. on short tracks overall. It's 16 on short tracks, but at Martinsville, is 21. You know what? I'll still take the gamble because that's how consistent he's been all year. I'll still take the gamble. Got it on yeah. tape. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I can't. I, even, no. even if I wanted to, which I wasn't, but even if I wanted to, it's too late anyways. So uh, are you at least willing to admit my pick of him possibly sucking this weekend is not as dumb as you first thought? No, it's still dumb because he's been consistent. <laughs> okay. Just, just want to know. Y'all probably just jinxed him too. Oh mm -hmm. God! Yeah, I'm I'm known for that actually. I I've been known to jinx a lot of drivers. In the he past. picked Chase Elliott once, and now he thinks he's Nostradamus. Hey, no, I didn't. I just made a video about it. That's it. <laughs> I made a video about it. That's yeah. all I did. Yeah. Oh, uh, was this Black Flags Matter? I was right. I was right. <laughs> Show up. Uh, oh, uh, really quick, Danny. You weren't here when we talked about it. Uh, maybe you were listening. I hope not, because I like the surprise. Do you know whose birthday this coming Monday will be? If he were still alive, mm, Dale, mm -hmm. I don't know. Bob Ross, and do you know where Bob Ross is <laughs> born from? Where? 
Daytona Beach, Florida. That's say, say that he he is Eric's great grandfather. Yeah, there you go. We have a running joke that Eric is Bob Ross. The chat always says it. So <laughs> it's funny when he wears a Bob Ross shirt on his Out of the Groove episodes. Birthday's one week apart from mine. Mine thing, last thing is, I have no clue how tall Bob Ross was because Eric is like six seven or something like that. Yeah, he eye to eye with Chewbacca when he met him. Um, <laughs> so, seriously, he showed us the picture. So, uh, we should get in the news. What news should we go over? Because there's no really bombshell things. Yeah, um, there was. Yeah, there was. Justin, All or no, oh, no, I was about to say Justin Allguy or Spencer Gallagher retires. Oh, yeah. That's mm -hmm. right. We forgot about that. And I do have some insight in that. Um, I don't know if it's true or not. So um, I was working the um, the Senators Cup this weekend, and there were some um, there were some pretty high up guys at the Speedway who were um, sitting right next to me and stuff while I was um, you know um, helping write um, or well no not write uh, typing up some press releases. And basically, the whole general consensus is that Spencer Gallagher retired was the reason he retired was he was going to get busted again for. I don't know for whatever he was um, busted for the first time. Um, they they didn't know what it was, but that was a rumor that was going around. And these were some pretty high up guys that were saying this at the speedway. So I, I don't know if it was that though. I don't have any proof, but I'm just saying there was some talk with that. But if not, Spencer Gallagher leaving now. I, I mean, his dad owns the team and stuff, and I feel like he'll definitely have a role. Like, uh, uh, he'll definitely have a, a, a major role in helping that team's uh, Xfinity Series program move up. And that team is actually, I mean, they're they're pretty good. You know, they've had some different drivers in this season. They helped get Spencer Gallagher into the playoffs before he was busted. And then also, uh, guys like Chase Elliott, Alex Bowman have ran in the top five in that car, in those cars. Granted, yes, they are cup guys. But still, that team has to be somewhat good to even be up there, to even have a yeah. shot up there. So... You know, I, I really, I'm really looking at the options here. And there was something on Twitter on Monday, um, or no, yesterday, saying that, um, what was it saying? Oh, it was saying that John Hunter Nemechek could be a top candidate in that 23 ride for 2019. And so. uh, Chastain in the 42, right? Wasn't that yes. one going on too? Yeah, uh, that's what they're working on. Nathan CX755 asked when the next missing rings was. I'll just say this. If anyone in there knows my birthday, you'll probably know who it is. And for anyone here who might know my birthday, don't tell them out loud on like live and everything. I don't know why, but for some reason, my thing keeps losing connection never down again. So. Yeah, it, it was roboting earlier. My mic was having problems too. Um, oh, real quick. I, I did have that. If we're talking about news and stuff, you know, there's not much of NASCAR news, but, you know, we're still a sports-related show in a way. Um, if, if a lot of y'all, few few of y'all who follow my channel are probably uh, wrestling fans. Joe NOI, former uh, football player for Georgia Tech University, big star over there, turned WWE superstar Roman Reigns. He announced on Monday that he had to step away from wrestling and actually vacate his role as the universal champion over there d because he found out that his leukemia is back. So Joe and uh, we have you in our thoughts. Speed of recovery. We hope, um, really quick. Uh, there are 40 cars full field entered this weekend at Martinsville. I think that's something that, uh, we haven't seen much of this year. So that's oh, wow. a good full field. That's oh 40 cars, 40 cars. Oh. Um, this is another rumor going around, uh, and we'll know by the time this weekend starts, that apparently, now Bob Packers has tweeted this out, that's why I'm saying it here, even though it's a rumor, that the emojis on the side of the car will be switched out now till the end of the year with the NBC logo. So basically, for the rest of history, you will know when a clip of the next four races comes up, what channel it was on. What? Yeah, they're putting the NBC logo instead of the emojis, apparently. Why? I don't know if I know. I think I heard it was for this round, so three. I don't know what they're going to do at Homestead. but It keeps changing so much. It's like, 
Just when they fixed like the little driver emoji things to get rid of the stupid sticker that they were on the background and it kind of got decent and then they changed it again. I know it's, it's, it's like, yeah. it's another thing of changing stuff. You know, like changing stuff before anyone gets used to it. I, I don't, oh my, change. I don't know. Make a change. I don't know, Matt. I mean, it's kind of... There you oh. go. I'm just saying, there you go. For the rest of history, you'll know which channel these three races were on. I don't know. It's just fitting. You know, NASCAR changes its point system, like, pretty much on a whim and all the rules and stuff. So, might as well be consistent in that regard and change the uh, the white emojis or and change the, uh, the emojis up. I don't know. It's like, yeah, I mean, Evan pretty much said it. You finally got it fixed with the whole, you know, white box thing. Then all of a sudden, you just change them out for the NBC logo. I don't really understand it. Maybe it's a whole TV deal. Maybe they just really want to promote, like, hey, you know, like NBC, you know, shout out to NBC, I guess, for, you know, broadcasting the races. Um, I don't know. Other than that, that's the only thing I can think of. I really don't know why. Like, are we going to have Fox emojis once uh, Fox Maybe. takes over in 2019? Oh, probably. probably. I hope not. I mean, I think, they're, I think they're trying to sell that as a sponsor place starting next year because the contingencies are going to be gone sooner or later. Those logos will look nice and big when they get the uh, the numbers of the cars on the quarter panel. That's what I'm waiting for. Mm. Yeah, see, see, that's one thing. They've been trying that out in the K and N series. They've been trying out the, you know, getting your sponsor on the like the biggest part of the side, and then the number just being in the back. Honestly, you see other racing series doing that ac across the world. I'm honestly kind of okay with the idea. I know it's not traditional, but I like it. I, that's just me personally. I think it looks cool. It's different. Like the contingencies. I've been there forever. It's just kind of like what you expect. But you can notice there's a lot less now. That it's no longer done through NASCAR. That's a team now who sells their contingency space. I think the cars look good with the numbers on the quarter panels. I don't think it's happening within the next year. But this whole idea is they're trying to see how much is that small piece of sponsorship worth. You could have more than just one company on the side of the car there. You might have a few on that door once the number's gone. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm right there with you. In a lot of sponsors, you can get a lot more space, a lot more visibility right there. And, you know, it just, it's not unusual. It's not like it'd be weird. I mean, I've seen a lot of uh, dirt late models do it that way. I won't be one of those stickler old purists. Uh, I'm not for it, but I will say if they want to do it, they should leave it as an option. I don't think they should mandate it. Into yeah, I'm right there it. with you. It's, it's, yeah. know, NASCAR, NASCAR is its own dictatorship. Like, I mean, is is it kind of like the the whole race team alliance? It, they're that's the group who's doing it. So I guess it's kind of voluntary now if you're in that group. But I think the idea is, I mean, it would be a team by team basis when it happens. But I don't know how long this this trial period is going to go on for. And the thing is, it's like as stupid as it sounds. Because again, I'm not for it, but I'm not going to like lose my mind over it. I found out this week just by saying something different about Martinsville racing that. NASCAR fans will freak out about anything. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like, like the fact that NASCAR is going to have to hedge their bets on this because <laughs> the fans are going to freak out because the numbers are in different places. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm not for it. I really would rather it stay like this. But I can live with but, it. Yeah, it's not going to kill me. But I, I know there's, there's a bunch of fans. Stay over here. We wouldn't be doing this. <laughs> It's, uh, I, I beg, I beg it if that means more money Dad, i think dale wouldn't mind it <laughs> you gotta have that in the comments it doesn't matter what dale would or wouldn't want that's irrelevant to this conversation it, it, the problem is is like you're gonna have all these fans and it's you're gonna have a bunch of new fans too that just jump on that bandwagon listen like i said i'm not for it you know i think that's pretty clear from what i've said but if drivers want to do it let them do it. They're paying the millions of dollars to put those cars on the track. The drivers are, you know, even though it's safer, still putting themselves in danger for our amusement. Um, why not? If they want to, let them do it. I'm not for it, but it doesn't matter really what I think. Um, Most likely they're not going to, so we have nothing to worry about. I don't know. I mean, they they said when they announced the chase, oh, it would never be called the playoff format. <laughs> Look what happened. <laughs> We are then again, I, I, and a drug of, oh, and a uh, oxycodone usage later that yeah. we know. Yeah. We'll say this: I never really expected to see that sponsor behind the roof number, so anything's possible. Yeah. 
So uh, speaking of sponsors, another rumor that's been going around, I think Bob Pockers also tweeted about this, is that McDonald's reportedly is going to spend more races and money on the 42 car than they are on the one car. Uh, Good. Any, any thoughts on that? It's smart. I mean, it's a smart. I mean, Larson's one of the rising stars in this league right now in the sport. It's. I mean, don't get me wrong. Wrong. Um, um, Jamie McMurray's been pretty decent. You know, he's a very serv- He's a very serviceable driver. But um, I mean, yeah. I mean, if you're gonna put your money into a, a driver and a team here, that 42 team looks like it. It'll be the the right way to go. Like honestly. I kind of always thought that the only the the only reason McMurray had that sponsor was because you know, Big Mac, Jamie Mac, you know what I mean. So it's like yeah, and, it's and kind what, of a gimmick thing. But it's yeah. funny. It's funny you bring that up because literally the 2010 season, McDonald's wasn't sponsoring anybody. They had just kind of left their deal with Richard Petty Motorsports, I think, mm-hmm. and uh, Jamie McMurray when he won the 2010 Daytona 500. His only sponsor lined up was Bass Pro Shops. He had nothing else. And then literally when he won that race, they asked him, what are you going to do next? And I don't know if he just said this because he meant it or if there was like some talk that made it. A Big Mac. Yeah. Yeah, he said, I'm going to go get a Big Mac. And it's like, Jamie McMurray going to go get a Big Mac. And it's like, whoever was at McDonald's, they saw that. And he's like, this is perfect. Let's, let's, let's get back in it. Let's, let's go with this guy. And then the next week, McDonald's was on the car. And then literally the next season, he has his worst season ever. <laughs> well, what I'm thinking, um, is this basically just, especially with his sponsorship, pretty loyal to him? Is this just like the final uh, confirmation we really need that Kurt Busch is going to the one car? Is that Monster is going to take over sponsoring those races instead? Yeah. I mean, I'm just thinking Monster probably will do the majority of the races. Uh, so McDonald's won't have that need to do the majority of the races. So they'll go over... Fulfill their obligation with Chip Ganassi and get you know Chip Ganassi Racing. I I could and- ace, I could I could easily see uh, Monster doing a majority of Kurt's races, but then someone like Credit One and DC Solar picking up a few too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could see that. And honestly, um, wow, we haven't talked about uh, we haven't talked about Kurt Busch to the the one in uh, quite a while. I mean, there was a lot of rumors going on during the summer. Not there's still so many unconfirmed things it's unconfirmed that he's going to the one it's unconfirmed that truex is even going to the 19 as of now truex doesn't have a ride officially yeah no it's not official yet and stuff but um i'm really looking forward to seeing what kurt bush can do with that car i mean i've said it time and time again i still think ganassi's holding back uh larson to his full potential and stuff don't get me wrong like you know larson's like he's good and stuff but i mean he's definitely like raising that team up and stuff and and honestly, you know, Ganassi, they're not that bad, but still, I mean, there are some certain guys who you know, like, okay, they're going to be a champion someday. And Larson's one of those guys. Um, Kurt Busch is really going to be interesting to see if he can put that team in the playoffs. I mean, with McMurray this year, it's been bad. It's just been bad this year. And uh, I'd, I'd say if Kurt Busch can make the playoffs, that'll be considered a good season for that team to be there. Even if they're knocked out of the first round, even if they just get one lucky win at, like, let's say, uh, at a Daytona or a Talladega, and they just suck for the rest of the season, and if they still get in, it's still good because, I mean, at least they're there. Wasn't it rumored that, like, um, Bush is contracted, specifically Bush is contracted to Monster Energy, and that if Monster Energy go or Kurt Bush goes, Monster Energy goes with them? Um, so going with that, um, I forgot where I heard that, but um, uh, so wherever if Monster Energy is saying they're going to the one, I think there's a high chance that Kurt Busch might be going to the one as well. I know we've not heard much on it in a while, but um, those are my thoughts. I do think Kurt Busch will probably end up in the one. Hmm. You know, let's just basically think about something real quick. We've seen Bush beer on a couple of the Stuart Haas cars this year. Lost opportunity to never have a chance for Kurt Busch to drive a Bush car. Oh. Yeah, it's not about that. That's yeah. an opportunity. Like McDonald's and McMurray and his crew chief, by the way, Matt McCall. <laughs> it's, uh, do you think they let Bush put all those H's after his last name on the back of the car also on the back windshield? Oh, Probably. Yeah, sure. just, just, just like a lost opportunity for Jimmy Johns not to leave Kevin Harvick and go to Jimmy Johnson. <laughs> Hey, well, might. You heard it here first, folks. Jimmy John's on the 48 next year. 
Oh, well, no, that's not confirmed. <laughs> you, need be, you need to be freaky fast again because that I don't know Carvick pretty much fulfills that slogan most weeks. Um, I, I doubt that's happening anytime too soon right now. Kevin Harvick is making people at Jimmy John's very, very happy. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, but- what is it, the rumor that Johnson either will get Gatorade or Red Bull based on the rumors? Which I have to ask, where did those rumors even come from? Does like well, Gatorade, have- well, Gatorade, um, they've sponsored Johnson before. I mean, Johnson's yeah. been in some Gatorade commercials like a long time ago in the past, like the early 2000s, you know, when so, he was first winning titles. So that makes sense. Now, the Red Bull one, I don't know. Gatorade is Red Bull. Because I know Gatorade's owned by Pepsi, and they're a really yeah. big partner of Hendrick. Is who's own who owns Red Bull? I'll look it up real quick. Is Red yeah, Bull just their own corporation? I think Red Bull's their own, but I think they may have a partnership. Everyone's connected to somebody some way, right? So yeah, yeah. I think I wonder could they even do both? Because right now I don't know if Pepsi even has a big energy drink. They don't have AMP anymore, as far as I know. No, or at, least, or at least they do. But they they, they still don't like the whole monster thing. You can't buy any Hendrick merchandise with a Monster Energy logo on it at all. Yeah, did they yeah. do last week where there was only one Monster logo instead of the two? On yeah, the- it was only on one side of Chase's car. But like, they're not even slick about it. Like, I have a NASCAR calendar, and it's it, this month. It's a picture of Chase Elliott's car, and like, they could have photoshopped out the Monster logo, right? Just put blue. No, there's just a black box over the Monster logo. That's how petty they are about it. I'll tell you what I do with all of my uh, 124 scale diecast for Hendrick. There's a guy uh, that I know online. He literally makes decals that he just prints off and you just peel them off and you put them onto your car. I want to do I, I have a bunch and I'm, I, I haven't done it just because I want to leave them as is for like resale stuff and whatnot. But it does bug me that on all these Hendrick cars I have, there's a, oh, just it's, a spot it's just a little, missing. It's just a little yeah. sticker. You, sticker you know, that goes on. Like well, like, it's it bugs me because like I have a Chase Elliott Hooters car from last year, and like they could have moved the contingencies up, and you just wouldn't have known. But instead, they just erase it, so there's this obvious spot missing, and it, it yeah. just irks me. <laughs> Is it that way in the games as well, like in Heat Three? Yeah, uh, I it's so it like they, it's not the windshield banner on the front; it's their last name. I mean, it's everything. Yeah, no, I noticed no, on no, uh, the, my the last name. Card. It, it, they make them exactly how they make the die cast. The last name is on the back, and it's just blank in the front. Yeah, I noticed that in my junior die cast when that was the Mountain Dew one. So I got Todd. Like, why is his name and you know why is the monster thing not here? Why is it just black? And I'm like, oh, because isn't Monster owned by like Coca Cola or something? I don't. Yes. I don't. I think they're their own. Hmm. I'm not yeah, sure. Or, or nation put that's not. How can it not be fully owned? There's just more than one owner, apparently. <laughs> Carnation would know. Yeah, it'd be that um, that Coca Cola holds a, a large market share of of Monster Energy, but uh, I know they have a distribution partnership. They used to work in a gas station, so they would always distribute it to Coke vendor. Okay. Uh, Red Bull, by the way, is its own thing. Yeah, I, I, that's what it looked like when I looked it up um let's see what else oh they did uh testing for the 2019 package and basically they barely lifted it all like going into turn one hmm. no real change of speed and you know you know that once these crew chiefs get their hands on this and all of them start working on it there's going to be no lifting whatsoever at like yeah. mile and a half like this so but I, don't know. Know. I don't know if the drivers are comfortable with it and they put on a good show maybe it won't be that bad I'm not that optimistic. I don't. Yeah, I have to kind of sigh with um, Jerry here, man. I, I, I mean, I, these crew chiefs. I mean, they're just so smart. NASCAR underestimates these crew chiefs all the time. And these teams, like, I mean, they're not idiots. Obviously, they're building like freaking like amazing machines out here, going like 200 miles an hour, and just the aerodynamics is just is off the charts. I, I mean, once these crew chiefs get it figured out. I don't know. Hopefully, it's not like just single file racing and stuff, but only like a little bit slower. Like I just hope that's not the case. But I don't know. I'm just not sure. Like usually, I mean, I I'd, I'd like to to be positive on this, but with NASCAR's track record as of recently, it's hard to. The racing's been better the last couple of years, though. But with something like that, it just feels like if they're slower, it takes out a lot of the variables of racing. Um, which might not make for the best shows in the world. 
someone in the chat just asked, uh, you guys like the Supra? And it just made me start thinking, honestly, uh, the Supra, as far as it goes in NASCAR, it looks just the same as the Camry, just the front is a little bit different. Like, it's just little changes on the NASCAR version of it. But as far as the straight version of the Supra, looks like it's going to be a great car, but I'm so bummed. Y'all know that I work for a Toyota dealer. That's going to be a showroom only car. I'll never get to test drive it. What? Oh, man. Yeah, it's not bad. I remember when it was first announced, fans like lost their minds again, like always, when everything, I mean, whenever something's announced or whatever, they just freaking go berserk. Not all, not all, not all NASCAR fans, but some do. Most. I don't know. Most. <laughs> I, I'd agree with that. There's a lot of time in between races, so you need to have something to do to keep you busy. Complaining always fits yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you think we have a yeah. two hour show every <laughs> Wednesday night? <laughs> we just complain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just re- just re- rename it from NASCAR Weekly Podcast to Four Guys Complain. <laughs> four, guys guys complain. Yeah. <laughs> four Guys Complain with guests. <laughs> uh, okay, other news. So, uh, came out. We talked about it last week. This book came out. I got my copy. I'm 40, 44 pages in. It is pretty good. Uh, you, you, he goes, Junior goes in depth a lot on what he went through with concussions, uh, the major ones especially, the ineptitude of Kansas Speedway safety, um, safety team. Like, they, like literally that testing crash, right, that he hit the wall at 207 miles an hour after hit, having a flat tire, not a single ambulance went out to his car. Brad Keselowski was the first person because he got in a street car in the garage when he heard the crash a mile away to get to the car. So wait, can't, what? That's serious. Yeah. Brad Keselowski and Steve Letart were the first people to the car and then a tow truck towed the car out. Mm. Wow. So there was no people on scene or whatever. So well, I don't know what the deal was, but uh, Kansas Speedway, if any of anyone from there is watching, not a good look. Not a good look whatsoever. Uh, testing sessions, do they have something where you just they got discretion? They got I don't know, but I mean they have to have a doctor at the track. I'm pretty sure when there's drivers and when there's people yeah. working there, you know they always have. I mean, I'd assume Darian, you might know better than me because you work at the Speedway. But is there always somebody on hand in the medical center? All the time, all the time, like a hundred, like every time, like even for like the. Um, the dream racing, um, you know, cars and stuff. When we have like people from like literally all over the world come to the speedway just to do this dream racing thing, and also for the Richard Petty driving experience, man. Yeah, I've I've, uh, I've um, been around that place and stuff. I've uh, gotten a uh, a fully detailed tour of it, and yeah, there's always people in there, no matter what. Even if there's nothing going on, there's always people staffed. And this reminds me of like back in 2002, I just had to pull it up because I, I was reminded of it with this, with nobody going to the scene, that's crazy. It reminds me of like what happened with Eric Martin back in 2002. I think it was, yeah, it was an ARCA, ARCA race where in practice, this was before they had spotters um, actually. Oh my gosh. Or, yeah. Uh, yeah, during practices. So um, what happened was um, a car spun off four, hit the wall, was like parked in front of the track. Deborah Renshaw, drives into the driver's side door and uh, Eric Martin wound up, wound up dying and then they had the mandate spotters are required to be uh, present during all all any time a car is on track period mm-hmm. that that's weird man look what is with that so 2001 Blaze Alexander gets killed then that's when NASCAR all of a sudden decides to mandate the Hans device then 2002 you have an accident like this with 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 Eric Martin and then in ARCA, the NASCAR is all of a sudden like, yeah, we're going to mandate this. Like, all this stuff sh- should have been – this is like – I don't know. This is just basic common sense to me. And granted, yeah, it, it was the early 2000s. But, I mean, come on. Like, like you had like four or five deaths before the Blaze Alexander one. And then these cars are going like, what, 200 miles an hour at some places? And you don't have spotters mandated? Hmm. I don't know. I don't know about all that. It seems like that should be common sense to me. I think it's like a dark period with all the deaths and stuff. Yeah. Well, I think we're, um, with a lot of people our age, we sort of just grown up with, you know, that's just how it's been. You know, like 
for us that have started watching 2004, 2005, I mean, it was only two, three, four years before we started watching, like that was how NASCAR was, you know, and you know, the stuff that you don't see behind the scenes that NASCAR does, like with, uh, with, what do you call it? The, the checkups that they do with the doctors after a crash. And it was just basically feel all right. Yeah. All right. Go home. <laughs> I mean, that's just the stuff you don't see. So I don't know. No research and plot on my list. You see a lot of like the bare bones, what NASCAR was back in like the seventies and sixties and eighties uh, before my time. And it's just a completely different piece. Everybody's pretty much to themselves for themselves. Um, safety. Uh, that's, that's secondary. We gotta get this car going fast first. Yep. Yeah. Just, just to put it how brutal the seventies NASCAR um, period was. Um, there was this video at Daytona. It was like 72, 73. I can't remember who the fatal crash was for, but they showed the crash. And then unfortunately, um, behold to me, cause I didn't know they were going to show this part. And I was scared like shitless when I saw it, they showed like the dude who they got out of the car. I'm like basically on a stretcher and he was dead. His freaking neck was turned. Like his head was turned. Like his, his face was like right here. That's how bad that was. I was like, Oh my gosh. I don't know. This is just, that's just, it, it seems like it, was. it seems like common sense because it's all we've seen. So I like I kind of understand the standpoint of people not thinking that far ahead, and that's why unfortunately a lot of safety stuff is always reactionary. So I I I kind of get why this stuff. I mean, we didn't we had the safer barrier and didn't decide to put it on all the walls till we hit all the walls. You think that would make mm -hmm. sense, right? So I, I get it, but you talk about safety stuff, and it seems like. You know, we're talking about stuff that happened in the long time ago in the past, and you know, talking about the whole. Uh, someone was talking about racing to the uh, yellow again, or something like that. No, oh, Larry and, McReynolds. Yeah. 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 So it's like you know, maybe, maybe it's maybe it's good to do it as it is because you know, hurry up and get to the driver, make sure their safety is put first. But it's like this is completely different here. But it seems like there there was a long time ago in Formula One, I think is what it was. Like there were safety officials out there trying to work a crash, and then cars were still racing, and like someone just got like someone oh, safety yeah. just got obliterated. Yeah, 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 um, yeah they literally was, just that saw. Was a, that was yeah. a teenager actually. I think um, I can't remember his name. He was like eighteen though, or something like that. He was trying to help the dude, and like while the wreck was happening, and then freaking car just hit him and what's was, crazy is what's no, crazier is that the driver like um they were trying to um, um attend i think he like passed i believe so or i well, think that was like another wreck maybe or something i don't know well and and i'm not like uh, no joke like i'm not making any joke out of this he literally he was basically vaporized like that's how hard like he was just hit and you just saw like a mist of blood that's it yeah it, it, i've seen the video um and that's that's why I'm going to make a video on this probably out tomorrow or, or Friday. Mc, the way McReynolds brought it forward, his argument was horrible. Like it, oh, yeah. it was cringeworthy. It, it, the, the points he brought up, he brought no facts whatsoever. I, I don't like how we do it now, but there's really no good way to do it. Like fans are going to be mad no matter what. It, on one hand, I, I like racing back to the line, especially like if one car spins on the last lap, it's like, oh, throw a caution. They haven't hit anything. One of those things. It's like, that. that's bad. Now, um, there, the I was. Oh, go ahead. I thought you were done. Go ahead. No, I wasn't. Uh, at the same time, if there's a huge crash, like the one we saw at Talladega, where someone goes straight into the wall, and it's like you, you wait a while after they went full speed into the wall, it's like, that's a bad look, too. Like, I, I know Kurt Busch was you know, angry because he didn't win, but at the same time, it's true. So it, NASCAR's in a hard spot with this, and this is one where I'm going to give them leeway. I'm not going to be as harsh because, you know, you literally have these people's lives in your hands, and you make the wrong call. Somebody like, you know, let, let's say that Eric Almirola, when he, didn't he, was it broke his back or his leg? Or I think it was his back. It was his back. Um, his back. Yeah, when he broke his back. Say that's the last lap. And NASCAR waits that extra minute or so to, um, you know, the waits an extra minute to go with the car. What what happens if he needs right away to get some to get care to get some medical treatment and he can't because we were too busy watching a finish and something permanently 
wrong happens to him, you know? So that, that's the spot they're in. I, I'll give my take. I didn't want to do it as a devil's advocate because I'm not really, I'm not sure where I stand on it anymore. I know I used to see it as black and white, but this is definitely not as much a black and white issue. I think that Larry McReynolds doing this made any argument whatsoever about it now look even dumber than it could have. And at the same time, any intelligent arguments about it now have to be, well, are you agree with this kind of deal? I don't know. Uh, it's complicated. I'm glad I'm not NASCAR in this situation. I, no, I, thought, I, the, I thought the overtime line was not a good idea. I thought it was dumb. Um, but I, I think that it could have been effective if that applied to the last lap. Because I know, you know, you know, in other series, if you don't finish under green, you can still have a caution on the last lap and restart. I think that the overtime line could have been a decent balance point to if you get that far on the last lap, if there's a caution, if you wreck before that, you'll restart. If you get past the overtime line, then you'll let them race back and you essentially have a, I know it's difficult on ovals, but you institute basically it's sector caution. So that half of the racetrack, since it's happened in the back half is yellow. And as soon as you finish, you have to stop. So I thought maybe you'd have half a track to slow down. If the wreck happens after that overtime line on the back straightaway, I thought that might've been a balance they could have gone with, but I don't know. It's, it's always, the problem is there's always going to be different circumstances. So it's tough to look at as black or white. Now there's also, I mean, I don't know, just it's, it's pretty dangerous just to be on the track either way, whether it's under green and caution and the 2004 uh, goodies dash series race at Daytona is a perfect example. So there was this guy, I can't remember his name, but he was a paraplegic and the only way he could um, make the car go or stop was I believe he had to like pull something while he was driving or whatever. I'm not sure how that works, but there was a worker on there who was working the scene of a crash and he didn't see him in time. So he couldn't pull what I, I, I guess he couldn't pull whatever he could in time. And basically the dude got ran over. And if you go back and if you Google that race, it's on YouTube, you can see like people hosing and they don't show you what they're hosing off, but Eh, it kind of clicked, you know, basically they were hosing him off the track, unfortunately. So, I mean, yeah, it's a problem, you know, under green and all that stuff, but I, I don't know. It's like, it's just a pretty dangerous place to be on either way. I mean, these cars are huge going pretty fast and even, I mean, they're still going pretty fast under caution. I mean, they're going 70 miles an hour. I mean, that's a the speed on a freeway. I don't know, around 70, 80 miles per hour, something like that. So, so yeah, I mean, uh, I, I don't know. Hopefully NASCAR can fix this. You know, hopefully they just keep doing what they're doing. But yeah, I have to agree with Jared. I wouldn't want to be in NASCAR situation here. It's a tough call. I completely agree with uh, with Iceberg. I'm um, I'm kind of. I mean, yeah, it's a very difficult situation at NASCAR a position that NASCAR is in, having to find some sort of happy medium for everybody. But the bottom line is, not everybody's going to be happy. Um, I think at the end of the day, though. Um, a lot of uh, the people who are in this sport and uh, elect to take this as their career path and elect to be on the track analyze this as a risk to begin with. Um, that's the first point I wanted to make on that is these people know they're risking their lives, know that anything could happen. So a lot of times it's on them to say, hey, I'm putting myself in this dangerous situation. Now, the thing that irks most fans, uh, especially myself, is the inconsistency. And honestly, I think you'll probably alleviate the most problems and, and backlash from fans and from people who are watching in general if you just um, get consistent. Find and make a standard, set that standard, and then enforce it and show why it works. And um, I think, honestly, if the window net's not, not down to like five, six seconds, that's when you should throw the caution every time. We had a um, 2007 Daytona 500 as an example of a caution that was thrown, and a lot of people, there was a lot of controversy on it because, yeah, it was a pretty... It was like a moderately large crash, um, no, no seriously heavy impacts or anything, but um, they threw the caution even though it was all behind them and all already unwinding. Whereas this one was right, right at the front, right at the where people are going to be crossing the checkered flag. And it was not, they did not throw a caution for it. So the consistency is what has bothered me over the years and probably bothered the most amount of more, largest percentage of fans. I think the best thing to do is just find something consistent. I agree. I will I will say this: there's certain things, and this is entirely different scenario because uh, Dell Jr. just took the checkered flag at Daytona in 2014 or no 2015, and you know we saw Austin Dillon hit the uh, catch fence and at such a high rate of speed, and 
he got hit again by the spinning car Brad Keselowski. And his Austin Hill's car was still rocking back and forth. And if you ever go back and watch it, just so many people ran out to him and just like didn't care if there was any other cars coming. They wanted to get there to Austin Dillon. And it's same thing like that does show you how how uh, com- compassionate everyone is in that sport. He wants to make sure everyone's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, do I, I do we have really any other news? I don't think there is. I know there's the 14 year anniversary, I believe, of the Hendrick crash. So, oh, you know, wow. our best thoughts and and wishes to uh, their families. But from here, I'd say that's a pretty good show. I'd say we uh, we covered pretty much everything we got this week. It's been a slow news week for the most part. Yeah, so, this is probably uh, the slowest one we've had in a while. So usually, like, we can bust these out and, like, oh, like, you know, we're almost at the two-hour stretch, but still, you know, there's usually more. We've we've hit our window. <laughs> Pretty much. Just you wait the next couple of weeks. We'll have some news headlines, I'm sure. Silly season's going to be crazy in the following the last, last few weeks of the season. Oh, oh this is it. It's already, I know it's some already news. been crazy. Oh, I know okay. some yeah. news. Kamikaze is going to Phoenix. Yes! yes! Kamikaze games. Evan, do you, I, I so you know hope who Kamikaze is, right? Right? No. You don't know who Kamikaze Games is? He's the rage master of NASCAR YouTubers. Garrett, explain okay. to him the whole Kamikaze Ty Dillon. Fill me in. Explain that. <laughs> okay, I, saw, so, I saw a tweet about it, but I didn't understand the backstory. He's a okay. very angry man from North Dakota. <laughs> he's not even, yeah. First off, he's not from the good Dakota. Um, <laughs> secondly, so the, the story that kind of goes with it. Now, I'm, I'm not 100% with it, but I'm pretty sure I know the, the – most of it um so he called ty dylan and austin dylan out in videos before and so ty dylan got mad and basically sent his followers from twitter to go after kamikaze to which kamikaze then made a response video uh ripping on him and he basically called him a spoiled brat and his brother um and i think it didn't austin dylan uh, send something to him as well yeah, you guys. Or yeah. No, 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 I don't believe. Or no, I don't. I know he so. was mad about it though. But anyway, so so, um, Ty Dillon's basically responded back with, "Well, if you you think you're so tough, come meet me at a race. Just go to a race." To which Kamikaze basically told him that it showed how spoiled and uh, silver spooned he was because uh, he said, "Unlike your family, mine is poor," and basically kept ripping on him to the point where they just kept going back and forth on Twitter and then YouTube videos back and forth. And I think, I don't think Kamikaze exactly hates him, but I'm pretty sure Ty Dillon hates, uh, hates Kamikaze. And since then their fans have been going back and forth on their videos, Twitter feeds, whatever, basically giving them trash. Ty Ty Dillon doesn't know the Kamikaze that we've got to know behind the camera. Yeah, he's actually a good guy. Like, this will shock you guys, but yeah, Kamikaze is actually a pretty good guy here. He's a pretty funny guy off, like, like you know, behind the scenes. So, and uh, yeah. I'm pretty sure he's going to be on the podcast next week. So, oh, yeah, he's on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the week before, uh, is it? No, two weeks before he goes to the race, so we can hear all about his plans and. But yeah, so that's sort of the whole story. It's basically been a Twitter, YouTube, social media beef between the two of them. And while it's died down a little bit, their fans still give each other crap. And which I'm still surprised Ty Dillon has. I'm still surprised Ty Dillon has fans. Like, well, let's, let's be honest here. I'm still surprised he even has fans. The way he runs and stuff. Let's just take the personality out of the out of, out of the equation for a second. Just why are you a fan of Ty Dillon? Why would you want to be a fan of Ty Dillon? The way he just runs. I don't know. It's just not good. But that's just my take. I had a I had a similar thing on Twitter happen. I'm not going to talk about it here. I'll tell you guys after the podcast. But okay. I had a similar kind of thing happen a couple weeks ago. Okay, I can't wait. Like no. There's no evidence left, so I'll. Oh, might not have caught it, I, I know what it is. No, don't I don't don't say it. I want to hear it. after. I ain't gonna say it though. We'll, we'll talk about it after <laughs> the podcast. I'm so should we just send the podcast? Now? <laughs> <laughs> Is that the question? Should we just end the podcast, do our now outros, and get curious. out? Now I'm just curious, though. So am I. <laughs> we're we pretty, we pretty much, you know, once we do our outros, we'll hit that two hour mark. So I'm 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 thinking we should probably wrap it up here. I think we covered everything. Let's end on that high note. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so, uh, of our guests, which two, which one of you two wants to, to outro first? I've been going second all night, so I'll wait and go second again. Okay. <laughs> what you want me to say, just say who I am and what I do. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. That's all. Yeah. I, I'm, uh, I'm tend to go. I'm a, I'm a tend to go. I'm a list maker for NASCAR. I've been uh, doing lists on YouTube, top 10 lists and stuff. I plan to do more in the near future. We're actually in development on one right now with, uh, may or may not be with nascar nixon but um will be uh that will be coming up in the next couple weeks i got a patreon i got a youtube for that and uh it's tend to go nascar follow me on twitter at tend to go nascar and it's been a pleasure being here thank you guys very much for having me on the show yeah thanks for being on man okay well i i thanks for the invite guys for having me um you can follow me on twitter at evan pasoco e-v-a-n-p-o-s-o-c-c-o uh our season's done uh if you missed the start, uh, our NASCAR Pegana Free stuff ended last night. I still encourage you to go watch it. It was a fun race. Um, we had a season with Joe Gibbs last year in the offseason. I don't know if they're going to be doing that this year, but I'm sure uh, we'll have something. But if it's if it's NASCAR and I'm racing, I'm there. So uh, thanks for having me, and uh, I'm sure we'll we'll be around in the Twitter sphere. All right. Thank you for being on. Uh, Danny, you want to do your outro then? Yep, I'm Danny B from Danny B Talks. I'm like bootleg tend to go. Um, I also do some list videos, <laughs> including my most popular series, Five NASCAR Drivers You Forgot About, which I am currently producing the sixth installment as we speak. I'm getting some new uh, cartoon animated avatars of Danny B that you see in my videos. It kind of sets me apart a little bit. And, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to trying to get back into making those more. If it means using up all the spare time that I have, I will do it. And most likely that could even mean less streaming on my channel. I think a lot of people haven't really been enjoying that. I get it. I know why y'all come to my channel. So let's get back into making videos like that. Tomorrow, though, I'm actually going to have a NASCAR crash compilation. Those usually don't come out until the season ends, but I'm going to just go ahead and put mine out now. Oh, yeah, I read about that on Twitter earlier today song you're using all right so i'll go next anyways thank you guys so much for watching another edition of the of the nascar weekly podcast um once again a new upload on my channel bobby labani championship seasons 2000 which is still one of the most underrated championships of all time it's crazy uh, a championship that dominant is basically forgotten about in history so um it's basically buried beneath all of the history and stuff so um, good to um, to basically refresh your um, your guys' memories on that. Also, um, I don't know, um, I'm thinking about maybe doing another upload, possibly maybe this Saturday or Sunday. I'm not sure what it would be. I'm thinking it would either be another Bad Seasons or a bus video. So uh, definitely look out for that. And also uh, make sure to subscribe to all of the guys', all of these guys' uh, YouTube channels. Well, well, except Evan, he doesn't have one, but make sure to, to subscribe to us. Uh, I do, and you don't want to, it's, it's no good. Oh. It's just random stuff. I haven't oh. posted on it in years, so just don't find it. Oh, just don't find it then. Then never mind. All That's right, fine. writing, fine. writing right channel. now. Evan has a YouTube <laughs> channel. <laughs> <laughs> um, Like Darian said, subscribe to all the guys. Oh, I didn't do my outro. Hold on. Oh. Anyways, thank you guys so much for to. watching. This is Black Flags Matter. Catch you next time. All right, go ahead. He's always got to get that in. You I, know thought, I thought we were going to get through it without it. Um, no, but as he said, down below are the links to everyone who has channels down there, as, and as well as the iRacing official YouTube channel and iRacing.com, so check those out as well. Uh, Evan's Twitter is in the description, I believe, as well, so go follow him if you haven't already. Tend to go is on Twitter. All of us are on Twitter, um, and for the most part, we're uh, – we're PG, family friendly. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, anyway, next week we're gonna be on Darian's channel for uh, all you I saw in the chat asking that. Oh, so we are. We are. I didn't know that. I forgot. All right, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, we are. <laughs> um, so for all of you saying to boycott the channel, the, the podcast because we don't read your uh, your comments, we do, and uh, don't all boycott. <laughs> yeah, we read all of them. We're ever present. On, like I said, Kamikaze Games will be one of our guests next week, as well as IDK Player, who has been dominating the NASCAR YouTube Pro Series preseason. Uh, the race of that will be on – two races of that will be on Sunday, our finale, before we just have the regular season in November, so that will be pretty fun. Um, as for me, 
Devil's Advocate every Tuesday. Uh, no missing rings tomorrow because it's every other week. So expect one at the uh, 1st of November. I, if, I mean, just you can kind of figure it out from that date if you just do a little research on it. Uh, nothing really else to say. Fun podcast. Thank you all once again for watching, and we'll see you next week on Darian's channel. So 